in the chamber. Thanks so much. Good morning and welcome to Vancouver City Council meeting of Tuesday, June 22nd, 2021, if you can believe it. Uh, this council meeting is being convened by electronic means as authorized under part 14 of the procedure bylaw uh, under the updated uh, ministerial order M192. If my connection is lost during any portion of this meeting, we'll recess until my connection is restored. If a council member loses connection during the voting process, uh, staff will work to get you back online quickly. And uh, if we're voting, we'll suspend the voting process until you're able to participate. Uh, council members, please reminded to keep their video on uh, so we can ensure quorum is maintained. Of course, we acknowledge we're on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slavos Youth Nations. Thank them for having cared for this land and look forward to working with them in partnership as we continue to build this great city together. And really want to thank staff for all their work. Um, it's what keeps this great city rolling along. Thanks so much. And uh, clerks, over to you for roll call. Uh, Mayor Stewart in the chair. Councillor Carr? Here. Councillor DiGenova? No. Councillor Fry? Present. Here. Councillor Swanson? Here. Councillor Hardwick? Present. Councillor Weeb? Present. Councillor Boyle? Present. Councillor Dominato? Present. Councillor Bly? Present. Councillor Kirby Young? Present. You have quorum, Mayor Stewart. Thanks very much. Uh, so for today, the public is uh, urged to listen to proceedings via the website or YouTube link, and that's all on uh, Twitter, uh, at Van City Clerk, for updates. And uh, anybody who wishes to comment on any items can use the web form on the website, and that link is um, also on Twitter and the live stream at Van City Clerk is the Twitter handle. Uh, right, and I also want to note uh, the City of Vancouver's longstanding commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion, including uh, utmost respect for all genders. So um, we're trying here in council to make sure that we address, uh, when we address speakers and staff, we avoid using gendered honorifics and instead use, uh, refer to the person by the first and last name, role, or title. Today we have uh, three administrative items one presentation, nine unfinished business items, two communications, three reports, five referral reports, 48 bylaws, one administrative motion. Then we have our notice of council members' motions, new business inquiries, and other matters. Uh, so the plan for the day is we'll go till noon, uh, then break for lunch until one. We go on camera from one till three, and then we we'll return at three uh, until we finish uh, the remainder of the agenda. Um, so can I have a motion to uh, go on camera later this week? Thank you. Okay, thank you. For, uh, all those in favor, yay. 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 All those nay. Thanks so much. That's been approved. The uh, reasons and the authority under the Vancouver Charter are listed in the agenda. Okay, we've got two sets of minutes, Council. Council uh, minutes one are the minutes of Council meeting of June 8th. Any corrections? Someone like to move these? I will, Councillor Paul. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Dejanova, second. Uh, all in favor, yay. 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 Opposed, nay. Thanks very much. Minutes two are the council uh, meeting following the city finance and services meeting of June 9th. Any corrections? I have a mover. Moved. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick, seconded Councillor Dejanova. All in favor, yay. 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 Opposed, yay. nay. Okay. Okay, Council, we have quite a lot of stuff on consent here. So uh, now we're going to consider matters adopted on consent. Uh, we have communications one and two, reports one, two, and three, referral reports one, two, three, and five. Um, referral report four has the presentation of the speaker, so it's being withheld from the consent agenda. So I've got uh, Councillor Kirby Young on the queue to hold something. Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks. thanks Mayor. I'd like to hold report two, contract award for provision of parking meter equipment. I'd like to hold, hold report three, downtown Eastside plan implementation grant allocation. And I'd like to, I don't know if we're doing it yet, but hold refer report for 1850 Main Street. Okay, one more time. You want to uh, report two, which three. is the, 
Report two, report three, and what was the last one? Referral report number four. Right. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Bly. Oh, thanks, Mayor. I actually was just taking myself off the queue. Those were the okay. reports that I wanted to hold. Okay, great. So that's it for the queue. <laughs> thanks very much. Um, so, Council, um, uh, does any, so I'm just going to read this out here. So, uh, we can adopt these recommendations in the communication and remaining reports collectively in a single motion. And uh, the ones that we would adopt on consent are communications one, change to deputy mayor roster, uh, change uh, to communication two, changes to 2021 committee meeting schedule. Report one, closure and sale of uh, land adjacent to West 29th Avenue. Referral reports one, two, and three. Uh, report one is CD1 rezoning in West 13th. Report, uh, referral report two, CD1 rezoning on 2929 Commercial Drive. Referral report three is miscellaneous amendments concerning various CD1 bylaws. And um, so can I have a mover to uh, adopt those on consent? So, so moved. So moved. Oh, sorry, and uh, thank you for that. I'll call for a seconder, but I just want to, uh, anybody wants to declare a conflict of interest on these items, should do that now. If not, I'll call for a seconder. Second. Thanks very much, Councillor Hardwick. Okay, Mayor, Mayor, this is the clerk here. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. just wanted to provide, uh, receive clarification on referral report five not being held. And that that's also going forward. Right, I'm sorry, I didn't see that on my other page. Right, so uh, Reform Report 5 was also not held. And that is the annual inflationary rate adjustments to density bonus contributions. Okay, so if, is everybody clear on, on what we're voting on? If not, I can go through the list again. If you're not, just let me know. Okay, so all in favor, yay. 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 Opposed, yay. Nay. Opposed nay. Okay, so those pass, uh, Council. So I'll just go through the list again. We've approved uh, communications one, change to deputy mayor roster. Communications two, changes to 2021 council meeting schedule. Uh, report one, which is the closure and sale of a portion of road adjacent to 2929 West 29th Avenue. Referral but report one, CD1 rezoning on West 13th. Referral report two, CD1 rezoning on 2929 Commercial Drive. Referral report three, miscellaneous amendments concerning various CD1 bylaws and referral report five, uh, the 2021 annual inflationary rate adjustments to density bonus contributions. Okay, so that's it on the consent and uh, everything good there, clerk? So move, before we move to the presentation? Yes, everything's good. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, Council, so we're moving on to our, uh, we have one presentation today, which is a transportation update, and we have uh, Paul Storer uh, for the Director of Transportation here to present the item, and then we can, of course, ask questions afterwards. So over to staff. Sorry, it took me a second to get unmuted there. Uh, good morning, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm Paul Storer, Director of Transportation, and um, I'm here today to present our um, annual transportation um, update. We've been doing, hopefully everyone can see this okay without any boxes. Sorry, I'll move some things around here. Um, so we've been doing this for a number of years, uh, normally in June, along with um, when we get the data back from our annual panel survey. And uh, the panel survey is a tool that we've been using uh, since about 2013 to get a yearly snapshot of what the transportation trends are uh, in the city of Vancouver. Uh, prior to that, we've had to rely on uh, either the census or transferring trip diary, uh, which are both um, only every five years and don't really give us a very granular um, assessment of what's happening out on the streets. Uh, so the intent today is to uh, give council an update on that um, as well as um, a number Point of other things. Please. Have. Sorry, yeah. Swanson, Swanson here. Yeah. Is, the, is the PowerPoint up on the screen that the public can see? Oh, it is, yeah. Uh, it just isn't moving along yet. And can I ask, are you seeing the 
proper presentation view? On the uh, WebEx, we're seeing uh, two two slides oh, at the same time. My apologies. I'll try again here. Okay. I'm not seeing it. One day I will. One day I will learn this. Um, here, let me. Uh, Paul Storr, if you can just press F5, that should put it to full screen. Let me try this again. I thought I'd solved, I thought I figured all this out, but. Um, nope, still. F5? No, it still isn't. Uh, I think you're just, if you go to display settings at the top. There we go. Yeah, perfect. Okay, and it's the same as the public screen, so please continue. Great, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, the goal today is to talk about uh, the travel trends, um, about uh, kind of what we've seen over the last year with, with COVID and how mobility has responded to that, uh, some of the work that we're um, undertaking as part of the Climate Emergency Action Plan, and some updates on safety and active transportation and transit. So there's a lot of material to cover, but I'm going to try to run through it uh, fairly quickly. Um, as council's aware, there's uh, there's a you know transportation is a big part of what uh, the city does, and we have um, a, a reasonably big budget that goes towards it, including maintenance of streets and and a lot of other uh, operational issues. But we also invest uh, in um, active transportation and transit, um, ways for people to be able to get around uh, the city. Uh, more efficiently and more healthily, as well as a real focus on um, on on safety and and people feeling safe and comfortable as they use our transportation system. Um, so I'll talk about some of the travel trends that we've we've seen uh, this past year. Obviously, uh, 2020 was not a normal year for for transportation or or for many things, um, and. This is this is on the left is pre COVID. So um, how people were were getting to work pre COVID um, and that includes remote work. And on the right is um, what we were seeing kind of later in 2020. And um, the big shift, one of the big shifts was we went from 7% of people working remotely to about 41% of people remote working remotely, uh, which is a huge shift uh, with the pandemic. And concerns around uh, physical distancing, uh, transit saw a huge drop. Um, so it went from about 34% of people commuting by transit uh, to about 7% of people who are working uh, using transit to get there. Um, we saw, so that was a big shift. Um, we saw a, a, a large number of those people uh, going to remote work. So transit, people using transit had the, were more likely to switch to remote work than. Uh, people who used uh, other modes, uh, but we also saw a reasonable shift um, from people who've been using transit to motor vehicles where they felt um, safer uh, during the pandemic. Um, overall, active transportation stayed pretty similar in terms of how people uh, get to work, only dropping by um, a few percentage points um, from the pre-COVID number. Uh, when we look at all trips uh, in the city, um, Obviously, again, 2020 was a very unusual year, and we saw uh, the bi big shift here was we saw a huge drop in the number of trips. So we went from almost uh, 2 million trips a day in 2019 um, to about, about 1.4 million trips uh, a day in 2020. So about a 30% drop in the number of trips. Um, and in terms of how, how people were getting around for those trips, again, the big the big shift here was from uh, transit, which dropped from 18.3% of all trips to a little over 7% um, in 2020. And a lot of that shifted over to um, some motor vehicles. So in terms of transit, the big, um, you know, transit had a huge hit early in the pandemic, dropped to about 15% of its um, pre-COVID numbers. And it's kind of crept back up to about 40% uh, in uh, 2020 and has hung, hung more or less there um, 
since. Um, and as we come out of the pandemic, one of the things that um, we're expecting to see is is um, a lot of kind of um, shifting probably in the fall as more people start to travel and uh, go back to work. Um, TransLink's expecting a strong ridership recovery throughout uh, throughout the rest of the year, and um, you know we're kind of thinking this the same thing. But it's it's probably not going to be without a little bit of turmoil as people start to settle into uh, new travel patterns um, in the fall as as recovery really comes in and people are traveling a little more often. So we'll probably see some periods where um, there's some added congestion on the roadways as people are still not yet comfortable. Um, with the physical proximity of transit. Um, but with that, we expect people will start, a lot of people will start to see transit as that really efficient um, way to get around and, and we'll start to see a lot of people back on uh, the transit system. One of the things that we um, ask people during the panel survey is about a car share. Vancouver is the car share capital of, of Canada and, or North America. Uh, we, we have um, some of the highest percentage of, of car share usage. Um, but um, we did see two of the four car share companies uh, leave Vancouver. Uh, so both Cardigo and Zipcar, well, Cardigo left uh, North America entirely, I believe, and Zipcar left uh, Canada except for, um, except for Ontario. Um, so we saw two of the four pull out of the market, but we're left with two um, kind of really strong uh, local companies who are providing uh, car share service uh, for Vancouver. Um, but we did, with those two uh, companies pulling out, we did see the number of people who are part of a sh car share organization um, drop by a few percentage points. Um, the exciting thing in the car share world is that um, we, we're, we're about to see a new uh, car share company launch in Vancouver um, called Zero Car, and they, they're a two-way car share service that's fully um, zero emission vehicles. Uh, they're starting with a fleet of, of uh, Teslas. Um, so this, this is exciting in terms of meeting um, some of our uh, climate emergency targets of shifting towards uh, zero emission vehicles. So we've been working with them on uh, finding street space uh, for those vehicles a few places around the city. And we'll start to see those on the streets uh, probably a bit uh, later this month or next month. So in terms of the pandemic um, and how we've been managing it, uh, some of this info we've uh, presented to council before, but um, thought we'd provide an update on it, um, including the slow streets uh, program. So in uh, early in the pandemic, recognizing that uh, people needed places to get out and exercise and places to travel more safely, um, we rolled out a number of programs um, including uh, Slow Streets, which has been one of the ones that has received a lot of um, really positive public feedback. Um, and we tried to roll them out in places around the city where uh, people didn't have as good options of, of places to kind of get outside and get some exercise um, and travel and, um, and also try to connect them to uh, parks so people were able to get to their local park instead of um, all congregating in some of the bigger city parks. Um, so the first phase, we rolled out about 40 kilometers of, of these. And in the second phase, uh, starting in the fall, and we're kind of continuing with this, we've been uh, rolling out um, traffic calming along the routes to reduce motor vehicle volumes on the slow streets. Because uh, the goal of these is really to, you know, for it to be local traffic only, so it's a lot more comfortable for people to walk and cycle. And where we've seen kind of continued um, higher vehicle volumes, uh, we've been trying to do quick implementations to to address those. Um, we had one that we removed after after seeing some issues and hearing some feedback on Wall Street. Uh, but the goal of these is to get things out quickly and then um, then hear from residents about what's working and what isn't, and then either and then adjust them uh, based on that. So that's been positive, and we're going to keep um, keep rolling those out. Uh, about seventy five percent of the people we surveyed earlier in the year. Um, we're seeing fewer vehicles and, and less speed on those streets. Uh, so there were some real uh, benefits there. Um, Beach Avenue, uh, we recently completed interim upgrades in 2020. Um, we had uh, reallocated the eastbound lanes on uh, Beach Avenue with traffic cones um, to allow more space uh, for active transportation and really to be able to 
um, allow people walking to get more physical distance um, as so they could kind of use both paths um, of the existing seawall. Um, this was really positive, uh, really popular. Um, when we surveyed the public, we got about 90% of people um, really positive about this. Um, and we came back this year and um, to a large extent due to the maintenance costs of keeping the cones out there, but also um, to respond to a lot of what we've heard through the, the public surveys, uh, we rolled out some interim improvements, uh, which was kind of low, low cost curve um, and, and some other changes that allowed us to put a two way tra transit back on Beach Avenue. So eastbound transit had been relocated um, as well as um, as well as two way traffic and uh, better separation between uh, people cycling and motor vehicles, as well as some um, significantly improved uh, pedestrian crossings out on the street. So uh, we expect later this year um, we'll start talking to the public again about um, you know what to do coming out of COVID and and what to do uh, going into recovery. Uh, but what we've learned through this will definitely um, support how we plan for the future of the West End waterfront. Uh, in our West End Waterfront uh, work that we're doing with the Park Board. Um, one of the upcoming projects that that's, um, we're working on that we're planning to implement late in the summer or early in September, well, into, into September, is um, really about uh, recovery. So, we, you know, as I said earlier, you know, trips are way down now. And, but as we see the fall come and people are traveling uh, for more and more things, um, you know, they, essentially the transportation network uh, isn't going to work well if all of those people are trying to get into cars. And we expect that there will uh, continue to be some hesitancy uh, from some people to get back in transit. I think we'll see that, you know, fade over the fall. Um, but um, the Smite Street upgrade is intended to. Um, Fill this big gap that we have in our in our cycling network with a um, kind of low low intervention route, the, the same way we've taken on um, Beach Avenue, um, to create a um, all ages and abilities uh, connection through the center of downtown, so that people who you know are, are still well, so that there's a better connection between the West End and the rest of the city, and places like St. Paul's and the CB and the rest of the city, but also. Um, so that people have a really good option rather than, you know, as, as they start to return to, to work downtown and, and, um, and taking similar trips to that, they have a really good option to be able to do that, not in a motor vehicle. Um, we recently uh, completed an engagement on that um, and heard um, over seven, heard solid support for it. Over 70% of respondents um, were in favor of it. And uh, we had really good conversations with local businesses and uh, stakeholders to be sure that it was the street was going to continue to work uh, for all their needs. Um, one of the other things we're we're working on um, to kind of roll out in the next month is uh, working with Park Board on how we can improve uh, the Seaside Greenway around Kids Beach Park. Uh, this is something we've had in discussion for uh, quite a long time. And um, last month, uh, Park Board uh, took the first step on this, uh, which was reallocating some of the parking spaces within uh, the lot to create a, within the parking lot, just south of the tennis courts, um, to create a um, safe and comfortable cycling facility uh, for everyone. Uh, we've been working with them on this um, and plan to do a trial of uh, continuing this um, separation around the corner and up our Vita Street, uh, which is quite a, has been quite a busy street um, to, to create the, the um, to really start to close the gap in the seawall through this area. Uh, we're also working with Park Board to start engagements on what the long-term uh, plan will be for this and um, are expecting to start that uh, later this, this summer. In 2020, Council uh, passed a motion uh, for, for staff to start looking at how we use our street space and to start reallocating it more towards um, more sustainable transportation and places for people um, with the goal of uh, reallocating 11% of today's street space. Um, we've kind of sliced and diced this in a, in a few different ways as we've started looking at it. 
Um, if you include, in terms of where we are today, um, if we include Room to Move, uh, the Room to Move program, so the slow streets, um, as well as, you know, all the temporary plazas we've implemented and patios um, and the work we've done on improving bus speed and reliability. Um, we're at about 1% of street space. Um, so there's a lot more work to do here. 11% um, of street space is uh, a lot. Um, essentially, it's equivalent to about 30 BC Play stadiums. Um, but the work we've been doing so far Far has really been informing um, our, our thinking around how we can use street space for people um, through the Vancouver planning process, as well as, as um, thinking about, you know, going into the next capital cycle and how we really think about our street space and, and using it uh, for, for neighborhoods and for businesses and for people. So next I'll talk a little bit about um, our Climate actions coming out of the uh, Climate Emergency Action Plan. So uh, transportation is about 40% of uh, the carbon emissions within Vancouver. And um, addressing those carbon emissions are a big part of, of how we're gonna meet our targets. Um, so the first uh, program that we launched um, coming out of the, uh, the Climate Emergency Action Plan uh, was the Climate Emergency Parking Program, which um, Council I'm sure is aware of. Um, it's um, public engagement is underway right now. Um, so we have a survey open until July 15th to shape your city. And we've following a first phase of engagement where we kind of asked the public about more general questions about parking around the city, residential parking around the city. Um, we've taken that feedback and, um, and uh, put together a draft, a draft plan of, of what that could look like. And that's what we're really looking for feedback uh, from the public on right now. And there's two components to that. Uh, the first component is a pollution charge. So the goal of this is really to encourage people who are buying a brand new vehicle to consider a low emission or a zero emission vehicle. So the pollution charge, um, a lot of vehicles, new vehicles wouldn't be subject to it, particularly zero emission or smaller vehicles. Um, but the idea is the more expensive, uh, larger vehicles um, would need to, would need to pay a five hundred or a thousand dollar charge in addition to the residential parking permit um, to really encourage people to um, consider a zero emission option when they buy a new vehicle. Uh, the second part of the program is uh, the overnight parking permit zone, and this this would be um, a a a permit that's required in all of the all of the areas of the city that don't currently have um, have parking permits, and there's a couple um, a couple key reasons for this. Uh, the first the first reason is, is it's a tool to be able to implement the um, the pollution charge across the city, um, but it's also a user fee on people who choose to park on the streets uh, to help fund uh, the climate emergency action plan. Um, additionally, um, you know, this is going to, uh, this would be a really good tool for us to solve uh, some of the problems that we're seeing on the street as uh, the city continues to grow. So, um, we've proposed some um, dollar values of and, and, um, and outlined what that could look like. And uh, we're going to be getting some uh, good feedback from the public yeah, planning and we're planning to um, use that feedback to inform our final recommendation to council uh, later this fall. Um, one of the items that got a lot of interest um, when the climate emergency action plan was brought to council was uh, transport pricing in the metro core. Um, and as we've looked, as we've uh, taken the feedback from uh, council, which was really to uh, focus on engagement, um, we've started to move forward on uh, the first phase of this, which is really um, which is really working with stakeholders across the city to start to really understand what um, transport pricing in the metro core could, could mean for every everyone and really looking at everything from uh, business interests to um, equity and and all of the things we're going to need to uh, think about as we invest as we investigate transport pricing uh, in the metro core. Um, it's really about under understanding what stakeholders' um, interests are, what their concerns are, um, 
and what impacts might be. But but the ultimate goal of this would be to uh, reduce carbon emissions um, and be thinking about the metro core as as a better place that could be could have more people, or fewer cars, and more um, more places for people. So we have a um, RFP out right now to select a consultant to. Uh, work with the, us on the program, um, and that would be both on the engagement side and on the technical work that's required to support that engagement. Another um, exciting, uh, exciting action coming out of the Climate Emergency Action Plan is the TDM, the Transportation Demand Management um, Action Plan, and uh, the Climate Emergency Action Plan. Um, uh, direct the staff to develop a five year a five year plan um, really to um, look at what what tools we have to take non infrastructure approaches to um, give people tools to not have to to not have to rely on private vehicles so much and um, this this um, where we're um, it's almost complete we're planning on launching that um, next month and we'll be providing an update to council. Um, but the goal is really to provide a lot of uh, strategic direction and tools to schools and employers um, and residents of the city um, to be able to shift their travel behavior. Um, and the first, the first part of that that we actually got ahead before uh, before the release was um, the school streets pilot that we implemented this spring um, across three elementary schools uh, in Vancouver in partnership with the school board. And this was where we. Um, we worked with the school and the, the parents of the school to close a block of streets uh, nearby uh, adjacent to the school and um, to, to give people um, better, to, to give kids um, safer and more comfortable ways uh, to get into the school. And we saw really positive feedback on this. We saw a lot of families walking and cycling more. Uh, we didn't see any issues with um, more vehicles, um, though we'd removed um, a, a, a block of street from the vehicle network adjacent to the school and really strong support uh, from parents of, for uh, continuing the program. So this is really positive and we expect to uh, continue working with the school board on this, learning from some of the things that we saw in the first uh, phase. And um, another thing kind of along a, a similar lines of uh, looking at how how uh, vehicles are traveling around the city, but um, looking at how we can how we can uh, reduce the impact of goods movement on the city. So there's a lot of trucks and and cars traveling around the streets, um, delivering small packages uh, to people, and um, we're launching a cycle logistics pilot that's been uh, fully funded by the province, uh, but we're leading uh, to create a small um, logistics hub for um, at least a couple. Uh, delivery companies to use uh, to be able to essentially unload cargo in MetroCore and then use uh, cargo bikes uh, to to take that package for the last um, the last kilometer of it, of its trip to really reduce the impact of uh, trucks on our streets. Uh, so we're really excited about this in terms of uh, trialing a new way of of uh, getting packages around. So that that will be um, set up this fall and we'll be testing it over over uh, the winter and spring and um, reporting back out on that in 2022. Broadway um, subway um, is, is under construction, which is really exciting. Um, the, um, a lot of the demolition work has been completed and uh, we've been working with uh, the province and the contractor on uh, facilitating this going well and minimizing the impact on um, on businesses of this and and on 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 uh, how the streets work, um, and we uh, just finished up a business awareness campaign um, where we use social media and uh, worked with uh, businesses to display um, to, to display um, the the I Heart Broadway uh, campaign, and um, that that's been um, a really good first step in terms of creating awareness that. You know, in, encouraging people to continue to shop on Broadway. Um, we've also been uh, working with the Broadway plan team um, to engage on the 
on design of the station block blocks uh, post construction. Um, so we'll jump into a bit of an update on safety. Um, so we um, we launched the uh, first pilot of the slow zone um, um, earlier this spring, and uh, with with a trial in Grand Lebanon, where essentially we um, implemented 30 kilometers per hour on all the streets in uh, the neighborhood between arterials, and um, heard really positive feedback from uh, from the community. Um, and uh, we've recently collected data on it, and we we actually saw a um, appreciable decrease in the area of, of vehicles driving over 30 kilometers per hour, which is a really positive outcome. And uh, these are going to inform um, how we continue to roll the program out, uh, but also our conversations with the province on um, trying trying to get the ability to be able to roll these out um, more efficiently and more more easily through being able to. Uh, implement blanket speed limits. Um, so that that was a really successful trial. And um, in terms of the neighborhood traffic management program, which we um, talked to council about at the same time, uh, we've had a bit of a delay in that program, um, mostly due to a focus on uh, pandemic response, um, but also some key staff vacancies. Um, but we have started work around um, the strategy for the long-term success of this program and plan to go out um, in the fall, um, hopefully where we can talk to people in person, which is really gonna work better for this kind of work um, with uh, the areas that we've um, previously committed to, um, to, to uh, work on traffic calming in those areas. Um, in terms of the strategy, we we plan to bring uh, kind of the bigger strategic picture back to council um, early next year. We've um, in terms of, uh, we've we've been doing some work around how we respond to public input in transportation. We get a lot of um, interest in um, in transportation from from residents of Vancouver, and a lot of requests for better pedestrian crossings and signals in particular. Um, as well as some other things. And um, this is great, like it's really important for us to hear the feedback uh, from residents, but um, it's important for us to be, be um, trying to make this as efficient as possible. So um, we're implementing a few things, including a, a self-service website that we expect to be um, up, for, up um, in the next few months um, to give uh, people a lot more information about um, what we're doing so they can understand where we're looking at signals, what our process is for pedestrian crossings, uh, things like that, and um, just better information about what's already coming. And hopefully some of that will um, help help people understand um, kind of what's coming down the pipe so they they um, you know they can understand whether the thing they're they're um, interested in is is part of our plan or not. And we expect that will start to um, reduce some of the amount of, of calls we get and, and be sure that we're um, able to focus on the ones that are, are highlighting newer issues. Um, we're also looking at how we internally uh, process these, which is uh, gonna be important to be continuing to be really responsive to what we're hearing from the community. Um, all of this work around safety has had a really positive benefit over, over the years. Um, we we have 2020 data. We're um, it's an interesting data point, but uh, because transportation has been so different this last year, um, we you know it looks like we've seen a good decrease in in um, vehicle and pedestrian collisions. Um, but we're going to continue to um, to see how this progresses over the coming years as recovery happens. So lastly, I'll give a bit of an update on active transportation and transit in the city. Um, so, you know, through this year, we've been continuing to deliver on um, a lot of our uh, transportation priorities. Um, so including signals, uh, we had six new signals implemented in 2020. Um, you know, increasing the number of um, beacons, flashing beacons we've put out those are um, really been really successful tools on on smaller busy streets, so streets that only have lane in either direction. 
Um, they're a fraction of the cost of a pedestrian signal and have been providing really good benefits. Uh, so we were able to roll out nine of those last year, uh, but also doing smaller things like um, like retiming signals to give people more time, people walking more times across the streets, um, improving accessibility, both of signals and working towards our goal of um, of completing the curb ramp backlog uh, by the end of the capital plan, and also implementing things like leading pedestrian intervals, which give uh, people walking a bit of a head start um, in front of traffic to give um, to give them a little bit more um, visibility, which has proven uh, to reduce conflicts at a lot of these locations. Um, in terms of our capital work, um, there's a lot of work still ongoing on that as well. Granville Bridge Connector is now in design. Um, and we uh, still expect to be uh, starting that work in 2022. And um, Richard Street and 10th Avenue are both two um, important projects that we expect to be uh, wrap, wrapping up in the next in the next few months. Uh, Richard Street was a um, was a project which was bringing a lot of walking, cycling uh, benefits uh, to create some better connections downtown, um, but also a but also included green infrastructure um, with, to help manage uh, the water on the street. So both of those projects are gonna be uh, wrap, wrapping up uh, fairly soon here. Um, and we've been making um, cycling network improvements uh, kind of throughout the city um, over the last few years, um, including a lot of uh, local street bikeways and improvements to, um, to our local street network. And lastly, transit. Um, so, Transit fell to 40% of pre-pandemic levels in uh, dur during COVID, um, but there's still a lot of people using transit to get around. And um, Translink's um, transit service performance review uh, last year still showed that eight of the 10 busiest bus routes uh, in the region were in Vancouver. And these are the ones on the map. And um, buses and being sure that they're operating well are really important. Uh, for the system, uh, about two thirds of total ride, transit ridership is on buses. Uh, so we're continuing to work with TransLink on how we can improve um, how how buses work uh, on our streets. Um, and we've been able to get a lot of uh, a number of kind of win wins um, through our COVID response and uh, the bus priority work. Um, for example, on on Robson Street, as we were reallocating space uh, for people. On, on Robson Street, we implemented some um, temporary bus vultures, uh, which along with some bus stop balancing um, resulted in, in big, huge um, efficiency improvements uh, for transit on the corridor. Um, we also did a lot of a number of other corridors, um, including um, some pilots on on a number of um, important transit streets um, like Main and Kingsway. Um, I mentioned Robson downtown and Georgia streets. Um, and those along with um, bus stop balancing, um, which is a program that uh, TransLink started to really look at where there are bus stops that are um, really close together and uh, figure out how to, um, how, to, how to adjust the spacing so it's closer to um, so it's closer to there and, and to international standards. And you know, stopping a bus at a bus stop um, adds a lot of time to the route and can add a lot of unreliability. So um, we've seen some good success on this program so far. Um, and we've also seen um, some really good responsiveness where you know a, a bus stop has proven to be um, important to people through the public engagement and um, seeing uh, good responsiveness in terms of figuring out how to be sure that people still have really excellent access uh, to these bus corridors. And in terms of in terms of those bus lanes I was I was talking about earlier, um, you know, over the last couple of years, we've, we've really ramped up um, how we are reallocating space towards transit. Um, essentially, we've tripled um, the the um, number of bus lanes in Vancouver um, over the last few years. And this has been a really big benefit uh, for transit and can particularly be a big benefit as we um, integrate it with other uh, types of bus parade measures. So 
Thank you very much. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions council has. Thanks so much for your presentation. There are a number of counselors with questions. Uh, council, uh, we have up to five minutes uh, for each of you to ask questions, uh, starting with uh, Councilor Boyle. Thank you, uh, and thanks, staff, for this uh, very exciting presentation and all the good work that you're doing. Um, I have many questions, so I'll just pick the highlights. I'm sure others will ask some of them. Um, I'm curious to hear uh, about the next steps in the um, school streets project when we might hear uh, what that looks like for September or for next year. Um, Dale Bracewell, I'm wondering if you would be able to answer that. Hey, good morning, um, Mayor and Council. Uh, Dale Bracewell, Manager of Transportation uh, Planning. Uh, for school streets, it's been exciting. And so we're already working with the three schools that we piloted with and exploring the opportunity to maybe continue um, with that one closure for uh, perhaps the entire year. And then we're also looking at up to another seven schools, um, which we'll engage in the fall and really want to look at ones that um, bring uh, uh, impacts to uh, disproportionately impacted communities and have some equity in the spreading out of where those schools would be. Um, especially if they can be along a greenway, but uh, I think some uh, real potential expansion plans working with the school boards and interested schools. Okay, great. Uh, excited to see that continue. Um, I'm also interested to hear um, about you spoke to upgrades that are happening along the slow streets um, and uh, council gets a number of requests or or complaints from people about those orange barriers being moved out of the way frequently in many places. Can you um, maybe give us a sense of the pace of improvements to those orange barriers and what uh, what continuing to improve that slow streets uh, project looks like? Yeah, so, um, so the slow streets project was, um, very much a pandemic response measure, um, and we used very temporary, temporary measures out there. A lot of uh, a lot of water filled barriers and signs. Um, we're doing a cleanup of those right now, uh, so we have crews going around and trying to clean a lot of those up uh, for the summer. And we're working on um, kind of what the longer term outcome of that program might look like, um, you know, beyond the pandemic. Okay, and is it, I know I've been telling folks that they should let the city know if there are barriers being moved regularly so that those can be uh, flagged and upgraded. Is that still the appropriate recommendation to be giving people who are uh, who are having concerns? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, get in, call 311 or get in touch with us. Right. And Okay, just want to make sure I'm I'm sending people in the right direction. Um, I'm also interested to know, it's great to see the chart about um, all of the increases to bus priority and, and bus speed and reliability efforts. Do we have particular routes that are sort of next up on the list or a, a plan over the next few years of where we're looking next for improving bus speed and reliability in the city? Yeah, we've been working with uh, TransLink on that. Um, you and, and coming up with a, a good strategy to be sure that we are um, improving transit and continuing to support businesses coming out of the pandemic. So uh, we're still working on the details of what those next corridors will, will look like translink. Okay, I will eagerly uh, await that list too. Um, my last question is a sort of broader a broader question, which is I'm wondering if staff have recommendations. I know um, we get and then send bring forward in motions or in other ways, some very specific requests from specific neighborhoods or schools about transportation and also want to ensure that we're, make, we're making those improvements with a lens on equity and not just focusing on who requests uh, them as the only metric. So I'm wondering if staff have any recommendations for council in terms of being able to respond to those public requests, but also being able to support staff in taking a whole city approach that's that's based on the data, based on equity, and not just complaint based or or request based. So a lot of our programs we use um, we use metrics to uh, prioritize things. Uh, the traffic signal programs 
a really good example of that where um, everyone, whenever someone requests a signal, we go out and we do a study and, um, and based on a number of factors, um, including how far it is to another signal and how many people are trying to cross and how difficult it is to cross, um, we prioritize locations based on that. Um, the neighborhood traffic management uh, program, um, right now we have a speed hump a program which we use kind of similar tools to measure speeds on a street and volumes on a street and prioritize based on that. Um, so, yeah, I, as much as possible, we try to um, use good data to prioritize our, our programs. Thank you. Uh, we're on to Councillor Carr for up to five minutes. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Mayor. Um, so, uh, great presentation. Thank you. My first one is also on um, the school streets pilot. I did happen to go down to uh, Lord Roberts School and just meet with parents and families involved. It was fantastic. So, they asked a question, which is, is it possible for us to think about connecting schools um, through a protected bike route to a regularly protected bike lane? Um, yeah, de definitely. Like um, we um, we heard some interest from from schools before in terms of improving how how kids can walk or cycle to school. Um, we have um, act safe and active school transportation plans that we work with schools on that look at the infrastructure in the neighborhood and how to be sure that um, there are good ways for for uh, people to walk and cycle there. Um, and the the um, the this, this school's program that we've been working on has been, um, you know, a really good way to connect with schools and for them to see what some of those improvements might look like. Right. So we're hoping we're hoping there's opportunities coming out of this. That sounds good. And I'm very happy to know that you are doing follow up work with with them. That's fantastic. Um, second question is on that real allocation of the 11 percent of road space, which I'm very happy Council um, decided on. Uh, are you working with our staff uh, in planning on the citywide Vancouver plan and to through the idea of our complete neighborhoods um, get people to input on what they envision some reallocation of road space in their neighborhood might be? Yeah, absolutely. The um, the road space reallocation motion is really informing um, how we think about streets in the Vancouver plan and and how we use streets uh, for neighborhoods. Um, so we're we're working very closely with planning on on thinking about how we can, you know, how we can use street space to really serve people as um, as the city you know, changes through the Vancouver plan. Awesome. That's great. Third question on um, the climate emergency action plan and the parking plan there. Um, I saw on that slide, it said that the parking plan is expected to reduce GHGs by 10% um, over a period of time. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering if that 10% is actually one fifth of the needed reductions we have to make, which is a 50% reduction by 2030. So the 10% is 10% of what we're targeting through um, the, the um, kind of room to move action. So the shift over to um, electric vehicles and the shift to um, more uh, environmentally friendly transportation. It's not overall GHG emissions in the city? No. Okay, <laughs> good Sorry. to know. Um, I mean, there's been a bit of confusion about that. It'd be great if that were to happen. Okay, that's great. Um, and um, just to, because there's been a lot of discussion about that particular program, I'm seeking clarification. Uh, for most people across the city, um, the the cost to them personally would be $45 a year for a parking permit. Is that right? Yeah, so, um... That's what we put forward for public feedback would be a citywide okay. permit okay. fee of, of $45. And we're asking people whether they, they think that's uh, a, a good amount. Um, only people who are buying brand new cars that are more polluting um, would be looking at the pollution charge, which is- Okay, so a personal choice. So if somebody chooses to buy a more polluting car and not an electric vehicle, that's when they get the extra surcharge, right? Yeah, that's correct. And the goal okay. of that is really to encourage people to buy zero emission or low emission vehicles. Okay. 
Okay, there's another part of that climate emergency action plan and the parking plan. Um, well, and, and the, in this case, the congestion charging. Um, now, I know that Metro Vancouver is also um, pursuing the idea of congestion charging uh, through uh, a lot of consultations it's doing, but it's written into the, the planning around the climate emergency. Are we as a city working closely with Metro Vancouver around this? Yeah, we're talking to Metro Vancouver. Um, you know, um, some sort of road pricing or mobility pricing has been part of pol regional policy for a really long time. Um, we're talking to Metro Vancouver about their thinking around it, and we're we've um, we're working really closely with TransLink on being sure that whatever we're talking about, they're in the loop on in terms of um, how it can be part of a regional solution. Excellent. That's it from my time, but thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young, up to five minutes. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Thanks for the report. I've got a few questions, so I'll try to fire through them. Um, the first one is in looking at sort of the overall update and the different measures and through a COVID lens where a lot of cities are, are being really bold, and I'm thinking of Paris and what they're doing with the Champs Elysees um, in terms of creating 1.9 kilometers for an, a greenway, pedestrian focused, um, parks focused friendly um, and I'm wondering if staff are looking to bring any sort of bold thinking around doing something similar for example to make Water Street entirely um, pedestrian only or to advance planning around Bramble Street and look at a, sort of a significant opportunity versus sort of this progressive incremental sort of allocation like with things like um, slow streets or patios which has a commercial use but is very different I think than space for people to kind of walk and move so are we looking for any bold measures there? Because I didn't I didn't see that in the report. And I think we have an opportunity. Yeah, it's really um it's been really interesting for staff to see what's going on around the world. And um it's really exciting to hear um, um you know businesses in different areas being being um interested in, in some big changes. These are these would be some pretty big changes, and we don't have, have anything uh, kind of in the plans right now. But um, but it'll be really interesting to see kind of coming out of the pandemic um, what the what the interest is in really shifting how we use street space. So, Paul, why, Paul, why wouldn't we? You said we don't need specific plans right now. If not now, when? Why wouldn't we seize this moment and try to do something bold now? Yeah, so we're working with uh, the DVBIA on um, council's motion on um, on Gramble Street. And um, you know it'll be it'll be good to see what comes comes out of out of that in terms of you know reimagining the street space. Um, but yeah, it would it would it would, it'll be interesting to see what uh, the community thinks about um, these bigger sort of reallocations of street space. Okay, I'll leave, I'll leave that there. Maybe something we can have more conversation about. Um, switching gears in terms of micro mobility um, and looking at. Um, other jurisdictions this is moving forward quite quickly. They're flying off the shelves when people are buying them. But obviously, if we have a pilot that is um, private only, we have to own it. I'm looking at areas like North Vancouver dis, uh, City, who July 9th will have 200 e-bikes that they will receive for free by working through a private partner or Seattle. Um, for example, I understand in condition of issuing a permit for e-scooters is that they also have to offer e-bikes. And so they've had a lot of them in the market for four years. I'm wondering if staff are following cities like Seattle, they're enabling those additional micro mobility so that people can rent them. It's more affordable um, and we can provide more sustainable choices more quickly. Are staff looking at that and following that, say for the Seattle example? Yeah, definitely. We're looking at uh, what a ton of cities are doing around North America and the world on uh, micro mobility. Um, our recommendation that's coming in a report to council tomorrow around privately owned e-scooters um, would be um, would be a first phase as we really start to understand what legalizing them on the streets uh, would look and like. That is a several, I'm just going to jump in for time. That is a several year pilot through 2024 and people are riding them now. So I feel like it's they're literally getting away from us. So I, like, are we looking for something in the shorter term and taking advantage of these opportunities to bring in these alternate micro mobility options, e-bikes and e-scooters? Yeah, we're definitely keeping our eye on what our what our options are. Um, with the e-scooters, you know, one one of the thoughts is that there already are some on the streets, um, and they aren't regulated. So, um, giving them a a place to ride, um, such as um, protected bike lanes and and local streets um, that are safer, will hopefully 
create fewer I, problems than being on site. I scan the report. I guess I'm asking about advancing shared mobility, shared micro mobility explicitly. Yeah. Yeah, so our, our recommendation at this point is to start with a, um, a private only to really understand how that goes, and then we'll continue looking at, at uh, other models. Okay, I'm going to look forward to more discussion on that. Um, in terms of the urban freight pilot, where is the proposed trial hub? Um, it, it would be in the Metro Core. Uh, we're thinking it will probably be in uh, the Mount Pleasant area, and that'll be able to connect to a lot of uh, different businesses in the area. Okay. But so tentatively planned, but not confirmed on the location yet. Is that right? Yeah, we're we're looking at a number of different locations. Some owned by the city, uh, some not. Um, and we have the RFP out right now to get um, a couple different companies involved. Okay, but the city would be providing the hub, the the location, and that would be the just at the five contribution. Uh, yeah, we we're um, we're doing the organizational work. Uh, the province is doing the is funding the whole thing. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Fry, up to five. Thanks. Uh, and thanks for the presentation, Paul. Uh, right off the top, one of my questions is just about uh, uh, Prior Street. Totally appreciate the new uh, sky blue um, crosswalks that have been installed on Prior. And just curious where we're at with some of the traffic calming on, on the road to uh, downgrading it from arterial and, and, and what we can expect as next steps for council direction. Yeah, so we had good, um, we had have had good success in, in terms of some of the work there. We've, you know, there was a lot of utility work happening over there for quite a long time. Uh, so we weren't able to roll everything out uh, quite as quickly as we would have, would have liked to. Uh, most of the work is done, including the blue crosswalks, as you said. Um, uh, there are still some temporary bulges uh, that we have yet to implement. We put some out and had um, had some issues with some of the turning movements. So we um, we had to remove them and we have a new a new design that's uh, kind of coming in probably next week. And that'll be most of the work right on on prior uh, that would be uh, would be delivered right now. Fantastic. And 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 can we expect an update on the St. Paul's trekking route uh, conversation soon? Yeah, so we're working with a new St. Paul's uh, contractor on uh, how their trucks get to get to the construction site. And we are, um, yeah, we're working with them on the main route, not being prior, the main route being um, through uh, terminal and, and other streets. Um, but uh, prior is a truck route on the network. So there may be times when some of the pressure sure. needs to use prior. Sure. That's, that's fair. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, on onto onto bike routes and uh, our, our two east west routes on the both north and south sides of the city. So Kent Avenue on the south and and Powell on the, at the north. Um, any plans on on some surface upgrades, uh, especially on the on the Kent side, and then ungapping some of the pieces where we see the Powell overpass kind of goes to nowhere and. Yeah, so um, that's one of the things. So the Powell one is one of the things that has been uh, delayed a bit due to the pandemic. Uh, we plan to start a uh, Wilson engagement on the Portside Greenway um, probably last year. And uh, that, that's gotten delayed a bit, but we do want to get going with that as soon as we're kind of out of pandemic mode. And that'll be looking at what our options really are for that whole corridor of Wall Street and Powell <clears throat> and, into, um, and into Gastown. Um, in terms of Kent Avenue, it's been on our map for quite a long time uh, to, to figure out the upgrades there. And um, hopefully in the next couple of years, we can, we can start getting going with a project to really upgrade um, cycling along that corridor. Okay, I'm still hearing some, some concerns around the surface, the actual sort of potholes and that kind of thing. Any, any opportunity to just do a, a more semi-permanent upgrade? Uh, yeah, we can take that back and take a look at that. Um, you know, the street gets can gets a lot of heavy truck traffic, and it isn't, you know, uh, well a super well constructed street, so it it does get beaten up. Um, we'll take that back and see what we can do. Thanks, Paul. Um, on the pop up patios, as you were presenting, actually, we got a really lovely email from from a resident uh, complimenting the Kamloops and Hastings pop-up and how great it is and how they hope it stays forever. 
and I'm just wondering what what we anticipate as far as 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 how we're going to um, what's the roadmap for renewal of these pop ups and long range strategies and how folks can input on where they would like to see these become permanent. That's a really good question, and I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer. I'm looking at who else is on the line. Juan, are you able to answer that? Uh, <clears throat> yes, good morning, uh, uh, Mayor Council Juan LeClaire, uh, Director, I'm sorry, General Manager of Engineering Services. Um, yes, uh, we are planning a report back uh, in the fall um, in response to Council's direction to make these uh, a reoccurring uh, feature uh, for every summer. Uh, so that report is something you can anticipate in September, October. Awesome. That's uh, looking forward to that. I guess uh, last question for me is around the um, the Transport Canada grade crossing regulation uh, compliance for the end of November this year. And obviously, we've talked a bit about the, the one uh, at Raymer and Cordova, and you've updated on that. I know that there's also some concerns around uh, Grandview Highway rail crossing there by the the Rona and all those kind of shops and stuff. Where, where do we anticipate some work on any of these rail, at grade rail crossings by the compliance order? Yeah, so we're still hoping to complete uh, most of them um, by the November deadline. Um, we have received an extension recently from uh, Transport Canada, but um, to have an opportunity to delay it by by up to a year, uh, but we still want to to, uh, to move them them ahead quickly. Okay, and so those are the, the two main ones. The and sort of and we're just at the five uh, minutes, uh, Councillor Price. So I'm going to move on to Councillor Bly. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, thanks, staff, for this uh, great presentation update. I just have a few questions, um, and I'll move through them relatively quickly. The first one is around um, the the long term plan around. Um, how the two thirds of transit ridership right now is on buses. How do we expect this number to change with the Broadway subway? And part two is there wasn't, I, I may have missed it, but a mention of the um, extension to UBC and where that um, is at. And I have a couple more. So if the answers can be brief as possible, that'd be great. Uh, so in terms of the UBC X extension, um, the, this Broadway subway extension to UBC, uh, we've been working with, um, Partners, including TransLink, on on a study of that. Um, so that is is um, going to be wrapping up uh, fairly soon here. Um, you know, we will see a shift to SkyTrain uh, in Vancouver as as the um, Broadway subway completes. Um, that's going to provide a whole lot more opportunity for people to get to Central Broadway because it's been really constrained uh, with the bus network. So. We expect to see a shift over to the the um, the SkyTrain network. Okay, great. And um, just okay, I have a follow up to that. I, I will send that in um, as we discuss the Broadway plan. But um, my next question is around um, wayfinding and the role of transportation planning, working with um, our whole city staff team around um, wayfinding as it relates to. Um, available uh, uh, transit options, particularly for people downtown, but also uh, parking, uh, let's say where, and you mentioned this, the new ride share um, coming in to the city, which is exciting. Um, what role do we play and is there more we can be doing to help guide uh, people in our city? Certainly as um, we look to recovery about how to use transit, where they can find it, where they can find parking, where they can find car share, um, and even um, beyond, so specifically around wayfinding. Yeah, so um, maybe there's a few aspects of that. The um, the traffic demand management action plan um, has a lot of it has a lot of ways, like has a lot of actions that um, are intended to help people um, figure out how to better use the system, right? So walking, cycling, and transit. Um, so it's a component of that. Um, on the parking side of thing, like better communication is always going to be really helpful <laughs> from a transportation perspective. Um, and the parking side of things, one of our struggles has been that we don't always um, kind of communicate meter prices and, and things like that as clearly as we could. So we're uh, we've been looking at um, trialing um, some systems to better indicate 
you know, where um, less expensive meters and where um, better places to park my feet, it really helped make people, um, give people opportunities to make better decisions um, on the network. Uh, Dale, I wonder if you have anything to add. Yeah, just um, briefly that the, the transportation demand management plan does include a specific action on expanding wayfinding. And so um, uh, that's going to be something that we can look into um, as part of that. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, look forward to hearing more about that. Um, just a question around um, visibility and safety. We get feedback quite often, uh, general maintenance of, um, for example, um, painted crosswalks and, and that sort of um, uh, prioritization around maintenance. Um, I'm just wondering if you can comment on the sort of philosophy we apply to um, staying on top of ensuring that our crosswalks are very visible and, and um, that the paint is not in disrepair and affecting people's um, ability to see the crosswalk, especially at night or for those that um, have mobility issues and may, um, may struggle. Um, so, yeah, so we have uh, programs where we go back and we repaint paint things. We have, um, we, we also um, really, you know, it, it's really helpful for us to hear from the public on where something isn't, isn't working, whether a tree has kind of grown over a sign or whether something's wearing out. Um, it's really helpful for us to get that feedback so we can take a look and. Okay, and so, so for residents to continue to send that in. Um, just one quick question around the viaducts. Um, when when is the decision coming before council on on the future of the viaducts? Uh, again, Lon Leclerc, uh, GM Engineering Services. Maybe I can respond to that. Um, at this point, um, the, the the viaduct project is very still all components of it is self funded, and it really is tied to the development. So when the development is in a position to move to its next step or advance to the next step, that's when a decision would come before council. And staff don't expect that to be. We don't. At have this point, uh, at this point, the the component that's moving ahead right now is the phase, the first phase of that, which is related to the Plaza of Nations and that development site. Uh, so future uh, developments would pay for future phases of that project. Okay, I'm not hearing a date, so that I got it. Thank you very much. Yeah, you don't have a date. Okay, that's my time, thanks. Thank you, uh, Councillor Swanson, up to five. Yeah, I have four questions related to parking. I, I'm wondering if you could tell us Brief, briefly, how you calculate the 10% reduction, or I think in some places it says 7 to 14% reduction. So we worked with um, we worked with a energy and economic uh, modeling uh, firm, um, Nobius, I believe they're called, to um, to really look at at the program and what it would take to uh, really shift a lot of people to buying electric vehicles. Um, there's a lot of factors. The, the reason we sometimes give a range is there's a lot of factors that can influence this. We don't know exactly um, how many people will choose to park off street instead. Um, but um, based on the modeling, uh, you know, we, we it looks like about seven to ten percent um, carbon reduction if the program moves forward as as we put forward to the public. And a reduction in what? Sorry, that's reduction in uh, carbon emissions. And that's seven to ten percent of um, the carbon emissions that we're targeting through um, the the uh, transportation components of the program. It's not the overall. Uh, it's not overall ten percent reduction in in carbon emissions. It's ten percent of of what we need to achieve. Of thirty nine percent. Is it ten percent of thirty nine percent? I'm seeing. Yeah, I think it's um, it's a good. Question: It's ten percent. Sorry, it was Navius Consulting, and it's ten per. So our goal is to reduce um, carbon emissions by fifty percent. You know, by twenty thirty, um, and forty percent of carbon emissions are um, are due to transportation. So it would be ten percent of what we're trying to reduce in the transportation side of things. So there's still a lot of work to do um, through other programs. To, uh, to meet our goals. This is the okay. first uh, step towards that. Okay, I got it, thanks. Um, do we need the overnight parking <laughs> permit zone in order to implement the $1,000 and the $500 police 
pollution fees? Um, it, the way, yeah, yes. I mean, um, we need a, we need some sort of system to be able to implement the pollution fee um, across the city. It wouldn't necessarily need to be the forty five dollars um, that we're we're asking the public about. But it's like you have to register everybody or something like that. Is that why you'd need it? Yeah, correct. Yes, we need to know okay. kind of who's parking to be able to enforce that. So could we exempt people earning say under forty k? from the parking permit and what would the monetary impact of that be? Probably most of them don't have cars anyway. So right now we are, uh, we're hearing feedback from the public and um, you know, there, there's various things we could do to, um, to mitigate impacts on people. Um, so we expect when we report uh, back to council, we will be able to outline uh, kind of what what the different choices might be in terms of moving forward with the program. Um, and uh, okay. yeah, and, and what One might more. look like. If the money from the parking permits and the pollution charges went to transit, how would that work? Like, would we get use 20, you said 20 million a year we could get from it. Would we provide free, free transit passes for people? Would we hand over the 20 million to TransLink? What would we actually do with it specifically? So the Climate Emergency Action Plan uh, suggested that uh, funding from programs like this be used to fund uh, the gap in the funding required um, to, to implement the, carbon sorry, the Climate Emergency Action Plan. Um, ultimately, it will be Council's decision on how to use uh, any funding that comes from the program. Okay. Okay, thank you. That's, good. That's it for me. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, Councillor Weem, up to five. Perfect. Um, yeah, I'd really like to see the streamlined road safety report um, that, that the public will be able to utilize. I'm wondering, will there be a dashboard um, that will showcase all the work that's being done? So how many streets and all that stuff you kind of showed on that slide to really showcase to the public how we are moving a lot of this work forward? Yeah, we're trying to um, kind of better explain what we've done. And uh, one of the key things is, it, is um, being able to communicate kind of what's upcoming so that um, you know people understand oh i don't need to worry about that signal that's gonna probably show up in a couple of years um so it's really to give better insight into what's uh what what the plans are for for upcoming work okay that's that's great love that initiative uh second one kind of follow up on Bly, the integrated um smarking technology so people understand parking um recognizing our connection with parking providers um, when are we looking to be able to allow people to know where to park, how much it will cost, so that we're they're not driving around neighborhoods looking for parking? So when when do we think we'll have smart technology for smarking across the city? Um, so right now, so right now we are um, um, rolling out pay stations across the city, which gives us kind of uh, better tools for that uh, commercial parking. And are continuing to look at, um, you know, what what technologies are out there that we can use to really help um, communicate, you know, what what prices are to to people who who want to park. So it's okay. we're still, not, still not entirely sure what that next phase of technology will look like, uh, but it's something we're we're interested in. Okay, just knowing we're a big tech city, it'd be great to see this initiative. We're seeing it rolled out in different cities. It really seems to be really effective. Um, so looking forward to that. Um, the next one, a few councillors brought up um, different greenways, different connections to schools, safe school programs. I'm just wondering when we will see that refresh of our greenway strategy brought to council. So we've been incorporating that into the citywide Vancouver planning process. Um, it, you know, it, it really ties in with how we better use our streets and how we how we can connect the city with a um, a network of greenways. So that's going to be um, yeah, for, from a transportation perspective, we think that's an important part of the um, the Vancouver plan process. Okay, um, you talked about that we're going to report back on the transportation demand management. I'm wondering what tools we have or incentives to, I mean, we lost Fedora, but we know there's a lot of delivery that are using cars at the moment. And I'm just wondering what incentives we could do to further bicycle businesses in Vancouver, um, recognizing that they could reduce the trip volume in Vancouver sizably. So 
Are we looking at business licenses for any deliveries? Like what opportunities are we going to do to incentivize bicycle based businesses um, and try to find ways to reduce the amount of trips for deliveries that are currently obviously with COVID have gone significantly increased? Yeah, so we're really excited about the cycle logistics pilot um, that we're going to be implementing with the province. Um, which will give us and, and really delivery companies um, a better understanding of what works well and, and what doesn't in terms of trying to, you know, shift all of these trucks driving around the city delivering small parcels um, to cargo bikes. Um, so we think that's a really good first step in terms of um, moving towards a more, um, you know, right sized vehicle uh, delivery service. But how about the incentives? Like obviously losing Fedora was huge, recognizing that restaurant sales um, from online services have tripled over the last little while or even larger. So I'm just wondering how we're incentivizing um, bikes. Like I know a couple of bikers are using Mobis to do restaurant deliveries. And it'd be interesting to know how we can incentivize that use instead of seeing single use vehicles driving around the city. Dale, did you have a thought on that? Yeah, um, Councillor, I just, uh, some of these, when it comes to licensing, what we've learned in ride hailing is to really do this, um, at least uh, in the context of the region. So TransLink is just starting up essentially an urban freight uh, working group. So there should be a perfect opportunity to bring that conversation about licensing, because um, again, it'll, it'll really impact other uh, cities as well and to do that in a coordinated way. Okay, and then I follow up on that. Um, the transportation pricing, why aren't we doing that with the regional context recognizing other cities wanted to see that as a regional and they feel like Vancouver is going on its own um, and then second one was a follow-up to skies um, when would we see us go from the one percent to eleven percent on re reallocation recognizing that I think this is an opportunity to go bold sorry councillor we were just at the five minutes so I'll move on to councillor Hardwick uh, up to five councillor Hardwick Right. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Um, you've suggested you're very you're really excited. I've heard everybody say they're really excited about this. Um, others are horrified. Uh, we've just seen a petition surpass twenty thousand uh, equivalent signatures on the the pricing on on the uh, the parking issue. So my question is, um, what happens when the public say no? Uh, do we wait for an election or is there anything that the public can do? Uh, we had an earlier survey. It didn't give us the results that we wanted and we've taken a new tact in how we're going to uh, undertake our surveys to presumably get the results that we want. So if the public says no, what can they do about it or do we just have to wait till the next election? So I think in terms of uh, maybe to correct what I what I said, um, I, you know, we said we're excited about the cycle logistics pilot, which we think is a good opportunity to work with business. Oh, I, something you, I, I, sorry, Paul, it was there was a bunch of excited stuff there, so I was responding to um, a larger thing, not just pointing pointing at you. To be clear, in terms of the um, the climate emergency uh, parking plan. Um, ultimately, that's going to be council's decision. Our plan is to get the feedback from the public. We already have a good, a, a lot of responses, which is excellent. That's that's what we want to hear. Whether people think um, we're on the right track or not, that's going to be really important to how we um, shape our final recommendation to council. And uh, then it will be council's decision on 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 whether to move it forward in in you know one form or, or another. Okay, so it's up. It, there is nothing public the public can do really until the next election on this. Um, you, I, I noted through some research that had come in from Research Co. Um, that there was a reflection um, in one of your slides that on reallocating 11% of today's road space. It says there's a strong public desire to increase active transportation and reallocate road space. And yet uh, the research co um, data that I'm looking at says that there that uh, roughly 30% said there's too many separated bike lanes in Vancouver and they should be removed. There's another 40 odd percent that say Vancouver currently has the right number of separated bike lanes. Um, 
there was a very, very small, I think 9% that said we needed more. So where are you getting your information from? Because it seems to be uh, in contradiction to outside uh, surveying that is being conducted. So in terms of, um, I'm not sure about the data you've, you've um, brought forward, it'd be good to see that, but in terms of um, the feedback we get, it's, it's through a number of surveys. So we've done uh, surveys around the uh, pandemic response. Um, you know, we, we did a, a broad one and then we did individual surveys about slow streets, um, asked neighbors about uh, implementation that we're, we're doing within the specific neighborhoods. Uh, we did a specific survey on uh, Beach Avenue. Um, so, you know, we, we really try to track um, what the, the public and residents of Vancouver are, are interested in. Maybe some methodological changes could be considered. Um, finally, the local area improvement uh, petition process is used by residents where they, they it, it, there's interest in getting you know, speed bumps or uh, things of that nature. You talked about um, various requests by the public to put in um, stop signs or stop lights. Can these be covered under the local area improvement petition process as an alternative? So there are, there are a few things that um, can be covered under that process. So traffic circles are an example of that, uh, speed humps and lanes. Um, there are kind of specific things that are are covered under that process. Things that are more uh, kind of fundamental to how our streets work and how we manage our streets, like stop signs, um, we would we we take a very technical approach to that to be sure that uh, we're creating streets that are as as safe as possible and continue to work. So that means that stop signs and stoplights are not included in the petition process, and and uh, perhaps if they were. Uh, we could benefit from the nuance of understanding in neighborhoods instead of uh, taking a one size fits all kind of approach. If, if I could time. just uh, step in for oh. thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, uh, Councillor Dominano. Up to five minutes. Uh, thanks, Mayor, and thanks for the update uh, presentation. I have a handful of questions, so I'll try to go through them uh, rapidly. Um, just on the subject of the self-service website, um, just following on Councillor Reeves' uh, question is, can you confirm that this will allow uh, both input from the public and residents around um, concerns they have around their neighbourhoods, as well as to monitor uh, what may come being up in the future in terms of pedestrian crossings or lights and so on? Yeah, that's the goal. The goal is to really help people understand how our various programs work, uh, kind of what's coming up in the future. Um, so, so that they understand that and give them the tools to be able to ask us for, for the right thing, basically for, for a thing that can, can probably help them. Okay, great. That's fantastic. Um, I just want to follow up on the, um, so I have four or five questions. So real quick, uh, the transportation demand management initiative talked about strategic direction and 76 actions to businesses, schools, employers, residents, and visitors. What, what can we anticipate in terms of when we talk about actions? Um, are these going to be regulatory that require compliance, or is this going to be we're encouraging you to do sort of X, Y, Z in order to um, manage better going forward? So maybe I'll ask Dale Bearsville to answer that one. Yeah, Councillor, um, it'll be primarily the latter. Lots of opportunities to uh, encourage and look for partnerships um, <clears throat> with employers, with schools, um, and and residents. And so the school street pilots is one example. A walking school bus is another one that we're scoping out uh, for the fall. And then uh, really working now more closely with businesses, especially with not just remote work, flexible work. Um, and then what can kind of be in the times that people still want to travel, what can be the ways to encourage active transportation and transit um, in new ways, but, but lots of encouragement and not really on the regulatory side. Okay, great, thank you. Um, on the subject of um, uh, bike routes came up, uh, Portside was already asked about, but um, I have a question around whether we're looking at improving um, east-west kind of uh, southeast to northwest connections, particularly around Kingsway, uh, Kensington, Cedar Cottage, Renfrew Collingwood connections. I've had some residents express concerns about sort of traveling those routes. Um, we have lots of east-west, north-south direct, but kind of that more diagonal uh, into downtown into our core is that something we're looking at 
Yeah, so through uh, the Vancouver plan process and the Greenways refresh, um, we're kind of looking at trying to figure out what those um, good connections would be for a lot of different areas around the city. But yeah, if people have good ideas about something that's missing, uh, we'd like to hear from them. Okay, I'll, I'll forward it separately in an email. Um, and then on the subject of um, the mobility pricing, I understand TransLink's going to be bringing their report later this year, possibly December. Has there been ongoing discussions around a regional mobility pricing model? And have we got any updates or are we largely waiting for TransLink to do more of that formal report out? Yeah, so TransLink's working on their Transport 2050 plan, um, which is kind of a long-term plan for the region. Um, there, we expect there will be there'll, there'll be some policy in there around uh, mobility pricing. Um, but again, we're working with uh, TransLink really, really closely on the work that we're doing to be sure that uh, we're really in alignment with um, the regional thinking on on uh, pricing. Okay, thank you. And then um, on the subject of um, we've been talking a lot about uh, curbing emissions, and I'm I'm curious if we get an update on discussions with the port. Uh, and the trucking sector on uh, reducing uh, carbon emissions from those vehicles. I recognize the technology may be, not be there, but um, uh, we do are a port city and um, obviously a lot of vehicles coming from outside the city into um, uh, a number of neighborhoods. Uh, so I'm just curious what that conversation looks like. Yes, we have regular ongoing uh, discussions with the Port of Vancouver. Uh, they're an important partner to us. And are talking about a number of things, including including that uh, we also met with BC Trucking uh, recently to talk about um, a number of things, but including you know how where they are, there are opportunities to reduce emissions in those vehicles. We understand there are some still some technological hurdles um, that are harder than kind of light duty vehicles, um, but it's something that they're really interested in uh, pursuing. And have we in those conversations? Considered, given that we're looking at uh, sort of a levy for residents, are we looking at a levy for uh, the truck sector as well? In just ten seconds. Uh, so that that's not something that we've talked about. It isn't as big a um, carbon emissions uh, production in terms of trucks moving around as all of the private vehicles in the city. So we've been looking really looking at how we can reduce emissions from the private vehicles. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Dejanova, up to five. Thanks very much. Um, my first question is regarding um, loading zones and drop off zones, especially uh, near medical centers or child care centers. I understand that, you know, schools have uh, particular ways of doing drop off, but for instance, child care centers may not have that and definitely have heard from parents over the years. I know that. Um, you know, Paul Storr and Lon LeClaire both have heard from, from me after I've heard from people who have been ticketed when they've gone to pick someone up inside a medical center, they've come back in three minutes, just wasn't enough to, you know, uh, get that person from their appointment safely down to that vehicle in that loading zone. So just wondering if that's something that had been considered or would be considered at all. Yeah, we're always um, looking at how we can manage the street space well, like new daycares in the city all need to have um, pick up drop off spaces included in the design um, to to be sure that they work well for them. Um, but yeah, again, it's, it's how we manage the curb space to best uh, kind of meet the needs of, of uh, businesses and residents and institutions. Okay, and can can you refresh my memory? Was I correct with the three minutes? Is it a three minute time limit right now? Oh, no, five minutes uh, for questions to staff. No, no, I was I was asking oh. about the drop off zone. Sorry. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I understand how that could be confusing. <laughs> so yes, it's three minutes. Three minutes for passenger zones uh, in the city. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Also, just wondering with the work that you're doing currently on the Adenac overpass. Um, and, and engaging residents and that you'll be bringing back in fall and also the work that you're doing with Hastings Sunrise. Uh, does this include in, engaging uh, residents that perhaps are frustrated because uh, of safety issues with sort of rat running through their neighborhoods? I mean, this is something that I'm hearing a lot about, you know, um, that, that the, you know, slow down children at play signs uh, and every other, uh, you know, uh, piece of, of 
neighborhood mitigation strategies that they've tried aren't working. So is that something staff is going to consider and bring back to council with recommendations? Or would you need direction from council on that? Yes, absolutely. The, um, the neighborhood traffic management plan is really about addressing those sorts of issues in local neighborhoods. Um, and unfortunately, it's been delayed uh, due to the pandemic, but um, the plan is to start talking to communities um, this fall to, to re-engage in the communities and really finding out, um, you know, what the issues are in those neighborhood and work, neighborhoods and working through uh, potential solutions to those. So it's, it's a very community focused um, program. And as we think about the broader strategy around uh, neighborhood traffic management, it will be about how we can um, kind of equitably go out to to neighborhoods based on based on the issues they have and uh, start trying to resolve uh, resolve issues. Thanks very much. That's my question. For now. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilor Dominato, I see you on the queue, but you've used up your time. Oh, Mayor Stewart, maybe I can. Um... Mayor, I'd like to move receipt. Um, of the transportation update today, as well as move an amendment. Okay. Um, Councillor, did you know that second? Yeah, I just think I circulated that as yeah, an amendment. I know. I'm just going to have to check. I mean, this is a verbal update, but there's no recommendations before us, so I'll just check with clerks and come back to you. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Dominato. Um, uh, we don't we don't often do this, so I just wanted to double check with the clerks. Uh, so uh, there's no real need to to move the receipt or the report. You can just move your uh, motion uh, regarding the topic that we're discussing if you just want to do that. Okay, thank you, Mary. I'm happy to um, move that. Uh, and, and the clerks do have that. Okay, and we have a second. Okay, we have a seconder, so I'll move us to the main queue. And Councillor Dominato, if you want to uh, talk about your motion, uh, you can. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Mayor, and, and thanks, Council. Uh, bringing this forward in light of, um, it seems timely given that uh, we're having this transportation update, and thank you, staff, for a great update. Um, uh, but trying to avoid more uh, member motions, that would be appropriate to bring this forward. And, and what it is is uh, a motion to have so staff look at uh, uh, as I've articulated, the traffic patterns, sight lines, speed, and collision history uh, along commercial drive between East 12th and East 22nd, including Victoria Diversion. Um, this follows on conversations I've had with a number of residents uh, uh, in the area. Uh, Councilor Di Genova has been part of those conversations as well, as well as with uh, residents further south, closer to 22nd and the Victoria Diversion, uh, particularly around um, concerns around excessive speed, but also the need for potentially additional pedestrian crossings. That area is seeing 
uh, a significant amount of development and change. It's also a very uh, popular area with Clark Park as well as Trout Lake Community Center. And so it is to ask staff um, to uh, take this into consideration. And as well, um, the other part of this is um, that along that stretch is Stratford Hall, which is a, an, uh, an elementary school, as well as CIFA Early Learning Center. And um, there is a petition uh, of over a thousand families um, asking that we consider a slower speed along the stretch adjacent to the school, again, uh, northbound, particularly as it's downhill sloping uh, past the school. Uh, they do have, I think, students K to 12, and then they have the early learning, which is ages one to five. And so I'm bringing that forward on behalf of the community uh, for staff's consideration and to look at that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have Councillor Dijanova up to five minutes. Go ahead. Thanks. I appreciate Councillor Dominato bringing forward this motion. Well, this motion. Um, I'm also happy to support it. I, I see this area uh, being problematic, and I think it even goes beyond, uh, you know, just looking specifically at uh, Stratford Hall, um, looking at uh, some of the other uses and child care centers around there, but also Trout Lake Community Center. Um, I have, have seen, and I've also uh, crossed that street with a stroller. I've crossed that street by myself. Um, when I was park board commissioner to uh, just as recently as a, a week and a half ago, and uh, noting that that cars traveling down Victoria also to the diversion uh, that meets at commercial there are also traveling at very um, high speeds. So when we look at the users uh, in the neighborhood and the fact that, you know, this is supposed to be a family friendly area and there are often are people who are crossing there. I think that it's important that we look at, at the uh, need for this beyond just even uh, the, the very good examples that Councillor Dominato has given that we've, we've both heard from residents specifically on. So I'm uh, happy to support it and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Boyle. Thanks, I uh, just wanted to um, say I'm also happy to support this and that I appreciate um, that the request is for staff to uh, look at the data and um, make reports back as I alluded to in my questions to staff on the presentation. I think it's important that we, um, as council in particular, uh, do what we can to be responsive to community requests. And I know this is where the, that's where this is coming from. Uh, it, and also that we make these decisions uh, on a on a citywide level, looking at the data, and with some sense that um, the the concerns we hear about uh, are likely not the only concerns that exist across the city, and that we're um, that we're responding uh, from an informed database perspective also to concerns at schools or other uh, traffic areas of the city where neighbors may not be uh, as uh, as loud in uh, highlighting those concerns for us, um, but are still, you know, for a number of reasons, including the many barriers uh, that people experience to participation, but are still experiencing uh, a lot of transportation challenges. So uh, just wanting to make sure that we're balancing that sort of responsive uh, decision making, but also an equitable uh, uh, database citywide uh, prioritization. Um, and so appreciate that this is really asking, let's take a look at what's happening here. There's a lot of change again, as Councillor Dominato pointed out um, um, and go from there. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young, up to five. Yeah, um, I'll be brief. And I just wanted to um, thank Councillor Dominato for bringing this forward. I will wholeheartedly support it. I think that the communities and the neighborhoods are the most intimately familiar with the safety issues and the pain points in their neighborhood. Um, and when they are rallying, it's usually because those concerns are pretty significant. Um, and so I do think that's the job of council to bring forward these concerns from the community when we're hearing them. Um, I'm confident that staff will look at um, sort of historic data um, as well as sort of the um, sort of structure and, and sort of other best practices around that in their response back. But I think it's important that council are responsive to those concerns um, because it's safety ultimately. And it's there's not a lot of point in sort of talking about general sort of other city building efforts if people just don't have that fundamental basic comfort um, in their neighborhoods and especially when you're dealing with families and kids. So very happy to support it. Thank you. Councillor Wade. Um, yeah, I I think this is great. I think it's great that the community is bringing this forward. I do 
concerned about this process of bringing a specific component to this report back because I just met a whole group of people that, um, including DPAC, on 37th Avenue because there's multiple schools and they want to see the Ridgeline Greenway improved um, for parents. And we had a group in South Vancouver that had another request. And that's why I was really looking forward to how we can do a streamline road safety program that the staff talked about because I think we need a more comprehensive program that allows um, this type of work to kind of rise up to the staff level. Because um, right now I think every councillor has one or two of these community risen projects that they could put on the floor today. And I think that that piecemeal approach isn't really appropriate to put one community against another. So I hope that we can come up with a strategy that's more comprehensive across the city um, and it looks at what opportunities we have to expand um, traffic safety and greenways across every area, including connecting parks and schools and the rest of the greenways. So I struggle with the fact that we're putting one um, and I think there's another amendment for another section. And I think that there needs to be a better way to do this more comprehensively and create a fair approach where it's equitable for people that don't have as much connection to city councillors to be able to bring their concerns and their suggestions forward. Thank you. Uh, that's it for discussion on this item. So I'll call a vote on this, which is uh, Councillor Dominato's um, motion in relation to this item, this matter. Uh, Council that has passed unanimously. Thanks so much uh, for voting on that. And um, I guess that's it for, uh, I see Councillor Dajan. Uh, Councillor Domino, did you have anything else on this matter? No, nothing further. Okay, thanks. Councillor Dejanova, I see you on the list. Thanks, uh, Mayor Stewart, as, as uh, you and uh, my colleagues will know, I circulated an amendment. Uh, it was specifically to address some of the issues that I had been hearing about. Um, from mostly parents uh, that live near and adjacent to the Adenac overpass that, and in Hastings Sunrise that are concerned with vehicles rat running through their neighborhoods and um, ex excessive speed, uh, especially when children are at play, as I'd mentioned before in my questions. I understand that that will be coming in a separate update okay. as uh, council direction has been given, so sure. I will not be putting that forward. Okay. However, I have sent in another amendment that I would like to put forward that I think to Councillor Weeb's uh, points, uh, this broadly ad addresses the entire community. This isn't about one specific neighborhood. And it asks, so I'll just wait for that to happen. Uh, I also just sent an updated version because the first one had a typo. So I want to make sure the clerk has received that. I sent that today um, at 1117. And it reads that council directs staff to engage residents in neighborhoods to review and consider increasing time limits associated to vehicle loading zones and drop off zones, especially in areas serving people with disabilities and mobility issues and families with young children, including but not limited to medical buildings and child care centers. And I have uh, over the past. Uh, you so know, before you speak to this, uh, before you speak to this, uh, Councillor Dejanova, we'll just have to follow the same practice we did with Councillor Dominato. So we would uh since this is a main motion but it's allowed because it's related to this item uh, that we've just discussed uh we would need a seconder for this to continue again council Weeb. okay so i'll go back on the queue here we're over on the main queue so councillor Dejanova, you have up to five minutes on this uh item to this speak to it. thank you um thanks very much mayor uh, and and I, I think that I it's it's self-explanatory. Uh, that being said, you know, being a former liaison to the Persons with Disabilities Advisory Committee, um, and also during my time at Park Board as a commissioner liaison to the Seniors Advisory Committee, understanding that when you're helping someone from a vehicle into be it VGH, a medical center, or if you're doing drop off at a daycare for one child and you have another child uh, who's in in the car, taking them out of a car seat, managing to get them into that daycare, uh, you know, depending on how many kids uh, you're having to move around with you. Uh, these are just some of the issues that have been brought to my attention where people have received tickets because they have exceeded that three minutes 
uh, that they're currently allowed. And I can't imagine, uh, sometimes it takes three minutes to wait for an elevator. So trying to pick someone up in a wheelchair or even uh, to put their equipment, be it a scooter or a wheelchair, in your vehicle. If you're assisting that person, taking them to medical appointment, I think that it is important. I'm not specifying what that time limit should be, but I do think that we should consider increasing it um, and certainly have heard from people who have received tickets or are too afraid to even attempt to do this because they know they can't in three minutes and don't want the ticket. So uh, that, that's the reason. Happy to entertain questions if you allow so through points of information for my colleagues, but this would be citywide. I'd be considering this. Okay, Councillor Dominato, up to five. Uh, thanks, Mayor, and I'm happy to support uh, this amendment. Uh, one of the things that um, I've mentioned this in the past around schools and drop-offs at times, uh, and as much as we're encouraging uh, people to walk and roll, and I see that with my my own kids' schools, uh, people are doing that. But on occasion, there are people who have to drive; they're going their own route on transit to a job. Um, but uh, particularly uh, for persons with disabilities or in medical aids and so on, um, it gives peace of mind. Um, you'll recall there were many stories um, and there were recently changes around hospitals and emergencies and, and removing uh, paid parking uh, because the stress it adds for people is there, you know, if they've got enough on their plates. And so I, I think having staff look at this and come back um, and, and identify whether there's some changes that are necessary um, some recommendations around slightly longer time so that people can do those drop offs and pickups, uh, I think is really reasonable and um, will just uh, help people again. It's about sort of that livability of the city and just getting around and, and quality of life for people and, and just simplicity um, and not having to worry about getting a ticket while you're helping a family member or dropping off a child for daycare. So appreciate the amendment and happy to support it. Thank you. Councillor Kirby Young, up to five. Yeah, I wonder if I could just ask a point of clarification through you, Mayor, to the mover. Okay, sure. Point of information. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's just the language. I'm just wanting to understand I'm interpreting this correctly. Councillor, did you know where it says engaging residents in neighborhoods to review and consider? So oh, my are you asking for the neighborhood consultation? Are you asking that staff review and consider? I'm just not clear on the language. No, I'm sorry. What I had done there is I was uh, changing a typo and obviously copied and pasted something else. So I could move an amendment to the amendment. If that's all right with you, Mayor. You don't have to work, Councillor Isnova. Can you clarify what the intent is, please? Oh, uh, the intent of this is to ask staff to, uh, or to direct staff to consider increasing the time limit. I think that I was I was okay. Quite sure so you're not that. asking for, you're not asking for no, consultation no. with all and the neighborhoods. No, again, that was that was an error. So uh, I'm happy to change that, Councillor Kirby Young. I'm just letting you know that in case that helps to influence your decision. Um, thanks, Mayor Stewart, trying to answer the question, but also um, express my intent. But I'll go back on the queue. Okay, thank you. That's it for me right now. Thanks, Mayor. Councillor Dayton, we have three and a half minutes. Okay, thanks so much, Mayor. Second, just sending this in. Thanks, Mayor Stewart. I did send that in. I'm hoping that you, uh, that, that the clerk can sort of amend it to no, really. No, it, it has to be. It's already it, in writing sent in, Mayor. I'm just saying that I'm hoping that it can be brought up on, on screen with the amendment as I. It, where, where, what, how are you amending? This is an addition to. Uh, no, I just rem I re removed some of the wording as Councillor Kirby Young had, had uh, right. Right. Yeah, but as this is a is a motion that's been forwarded, it need we need to know specifically what you're replacing rather than oh, make the clerk. Then I'll just I'll just strike and replace it. So this is a so I'll just strike and replace the first amendment so that I don't have to go through it, and neither does the clerk in red lettering. Yeah. So we, at our chair's meeting yesterday, we were just we just got to make sure that this is council's work, not clerk's work. So no, I understand. That's why I so. If it's a strike and replace, and that is not, uh, for example, is not, uh, 
proper. So you'd like me to withdraw it and re-put it? Because I'm happy to. I'm not, I'm just, I'm just giving you, uh, I'm not suggesting any actions for you. I'm just saying that at this point. Could I ask a point of procedure? Well, I'm telling you the procedure right now and I'm looking at. But my the clock is you. running. So if I call That's it a right. point of procedure, then it, my clock does not run. Okay, point of procedure. So my point of procedure is um, this, I'm, I'm, Apologies, uh, Mayor, I didn't know that you discussed this at a chair's meeting. There's been no memo or information sent to me on this. I have seen councillors send in amendments like this with corrections before, and they have been accepted. So I'm asking you how you would suggest that I rectify this. Uh, should I specifically uh, say what needs to be struck and put that in bold? Uh, I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to give you instructions about how to correct your motion. What I'm going to say under 8.1 of the bylaw, it says that uh, your um, changes have to be in writing and they have to be uh, legible essentially. So we have to know exactly what uh, what you're asking. So we do have a motion that's been seconded. Your motion's been uh, put forward and seconded. It is on the floor as is. So the text has been there and it, there has been a question of, as to whether it's uh, correct. So I'd like to uh, move to withdraw it so that I can put forward the uh, correct text. So you want to withdraw the, uh, so we're off the point of procedure now and I'm going to start your clock. So you're moving to withdraw the motion. Okay. Yes, at this point in time, yes. Okay, the original motion. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, clerks. And can you just remind me that, what does that, that is just, is that a majority is or unanimous because it's property of the, property of the uh, chamber? Mayor, it's the clerk. A unanimous approval is required of council. Okay, so we'll try a verbal vote first. So we have a, a motion from Councillor Dijanova to withdraw her motion. Do we have a seconder for that? Councillor Kirby Young. Second. Okay, Councillor Kirby Young, I heard it's a seconder. So all in favor say yay. 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 Opposed say nay. Okay, so that has been withdrawn. Rest of my time, Mayor. I've already sent that in. Um, I've actually just titled it amendment, and the council directs staff to consider increasing time limits associated to vehicle loading zones and drop-off zones, especially in areas serving people with disabilities and mobility issues and families with young children, including but not limited to medical buildings and child care centers. Okay, and do we have a seconder for this? Second. Okay. Uh, anything else, Councilor Dijanova? I think I've explained it correctly. I'm glad to know this now. I would also like to um, request uh, Mayor Stewart that we we receive memos on what yep. you've discussed. We're just following the bylaw enforcement. I know, yeah, I know, but if you decide something, okay, it's meeting, but hope for that. Thank you. Councilor Weave, up to uh, five minutes. Yeah, as the council liaison to the person just the advisory committee, um, I am supportive of this. I think that this is something that has been brought up a few times to the committee, um, mostly with some of the new sites, Person Dogwood and some of the other new sites that focus on people with disabilities and mobility issues. Um, so I think this is a good amendment and I will be supportive. Yep, it is a motion at this point, uh, not an amendment. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young, uh, you have about three minutes and 45 seconds. I have a point of information for you to staff, if I could. Sure. Um, and that is to the city manager, I guess, just a quick clarification. It's not necessary to say and report back to council, is it? Is it inherently that any changes would come back to council in this nature, or is it something that staff would do? What would, how, how would the, count, the loop get closed with council? Uh, thanks. Uh, through you, Mayor Stewart, maybe I'll ask Juan LeClaire to, I, that's my understanding, but maybe I'll just ask Juan LeClaire to confirm that. Um, yeah, I guess it, uh, I, in either case, would be reporting back to council. So, it, so you report back, and it wouldn't require any further amendment to give that direction. You would just do that anyway. That's yeah? correct. Terrific. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, I don't see anybody else on the queue, so we can call a vote on this motion. Councillor Bly, Councillor Dijanova. I voted mayor. There you go. Okay, that's uh, unanimously approved. Thanks so much, Council. And I think that's it for this item. Great, okay.
So we are at 1130. We have a half an hour council. Uh, thanks very much to staff for that um, presentation and information. Uh, now we're going to move to unfinished business. Uh, we have uh, nine items of unfinished business today. Uh, we have eight count council members motions and an unfinished business item from the public hearing of June 17th. Uh, just like council to note that EB6, uh, keeping handy dart accessible to people living with disabilities was, was withdrawn at the request of the councillor submitted it. So uh, we're gonna begin with the eight council members motions on the agenda today. And um, we have uh, just a reminder, we're right at the beginning. So council members have two minutes to introduce their motion and one minute uh, for to answer clarifying questions. Uh, the first item we're starting with though, however, was um, we, uh, I was asked to rule uh, whether or not it was in order um, and uh, we ran out of time. Uh, we didn't extend the council meeting. So that's the item we're on. This is uh, UB1 towards a quieter and emission-free landscape maintenance equip equipment feature in Vancouver. And so just a reminder at council meeting on June 8th, shortly before 10 p.m., Councillor Carr uh, rose on a point of order <clears throat> under section 8.7 of the procedure bylaw asking of the proposed motion conflicts with the previous motion passed by council relating to a moratorium on providing additional work to the development business uh, buildings and licensing department via members uh, motions and amendments uh, prior to be to given the ruling the uh, being able to give the ruling the uh, council adjourned uh, and so um, I've now uh, uh, decided uh, just by reviewing information and speaking to the the clerks about past rulings that this motion is out of order um, it's out of order because it conflicts with the um, bylaw that was passed uh, that restricts uh, giving direction to uh, to development uh, dbl essentially development business and licensing uh, we did uh, pass a moratorium on new work uh, given to this uh, this um, department of the of the city and so um, <clears throat> this is out of order because it conflicts with that uh, motion in force so essentially i'm upholding councillor Carr's request for this to be ruled out of order um, and because the moratorium uh, states that no work would be given to dbl staff uh, so even if this were the motion states that the uh, work would not commence until 2022 there would be some work where this would be assigned to staff or you know they'd have to build it into their agendas and routines, and this is consistent with with past rulings that have been made on uh, similar items. So that's uh, that's my ruling on that. Um, point of procedure, Mayor. I might. Point of procedure. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I want I'd like to challenge the chair on the basis of precedent that this council last month accepted a motion on notice, um, specifically the example being one from Councillor Fry and Dominato dealing with graffiti and nuisance graffiti that as in the motion as submitted included work for DBL and, and that was accepted. So there is a precedent that has been undertaken by this council in accepting motions on notice, even though it may have been subsequently amended after the motion was accepted. And so I'd like sure. to challenge the chair. I'm just going to check on the uh, process for challenging the chair. Just make sure you get it right. So I'll just uh, check you. with clerks and I'll be right back uh, on that one. Just one second. Okay, Council, just refreshing my memory on a chair challenge. Um, 
Uh, so what has to happen here is that the motion has been made by uh, Councillor Kirby Young. It would need to be seconded. Uh, there is room for debate. There's no room for amendments or no allowance for amendments. Uh, and then there's a vote. Uh, it requires a two thirds of council vote to overturn uh, chair's decision. And if the decision is overturned, then uh, the motion would not be ruled out of order and uh, it would continue as if that ruling had not been made. So um, <clears throat> Councilor Kirby Young has moved the motion to challenge the chair. We need a seconder for that. Second. Okay, Councilor Dominato, thanks. We're uh, on the queue. So now um, there is room for debate here. Councillor Carr is on the list. Um, since uh, Councillor since Councillor Kirby Young moves the motion, though, you if you'd like to add anything else, you can put yourself on the list and. Uh, sure. Thanks, Mayor. I'll do that. Okay, and you would be first, uh, and then I'll. Uh, Councillor Carr would be second. So please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm. Um, I think it's really important, and I've always been an advocate for consistency and application of procedure. Um, and. I did mention in um, the request to challenge that we had received a motion that specifically the graffiti one in the last month um, that had a number of uh, components and language and was accepted and put on the agenda that related to DBL work. Um, I would also note that in the course of regular, sorry, I would also note in the course of regular council business um, that um, recently when discussing changes to permitting, um, we had amendments also on the floor that related to DBL, specifically one from Councillor Hardwick that spoke to delaying the implementation of heritage, which was enabled, um, even though that also referenced the DBL work and made reference to the fact that um, that work, the staff would remain focused on clearing existing backlogs, the same reference that is made in this motion. Um, and that was also accepted at our council meeting of June the 9th. Um, so there has been precedent there, and what I'm looking for is consistency in application so that there isn't um, inequity or um, I, I guess it's basically inequity or inconsistency in how those rules and procedures are applied. And I understand that um, this is a chair's decision um, as, because I did research this with the city manager who indicated that that was the appropriate place that it be made and it should be a decision of council. So I just wanted to bring those examples to council's attention because we have dealt with a number of matters um, in that way and very recently. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, next is Councillor Carr, up to five minutes, Councillor Carr. Yes, um, thanks, Mayor. Uh, I just want to uh, refresh council's mind. I did make the uh, ruling um, in terms of the motion uh, or the amendment that Councillor Kirby Young referred to, uh, which was um, an amendment to a motion by Councillor Fry and uh, Councillor Dominato uh, regarding um, graffiti. And in that particular case, sought advice um, and input from the city manager and from the clerks. And if you remember when I made my ruling, which was uh, to accept that particular amendment, um, to to the motion uh, that that um, uh, I noted uh, that the work would not the work involved more than the Department of uh, Development Buildings and Licensing, and um, and that and I asked uh, for um, the city manager to comment on that, and he clarified, and I confirmed that uh, my ruling would be based on that clarification, which was that the work could proceed with staff, but not including DB, um, DBL staff, um, that uh, there would be gaps uh, thus in any of the work and reporting because no DBL staff would be involved with that work. Um, so uh, in terms of this particular, um, so that was the basis for my ruling that um, other staff would proceed to, to do some work in line with the amendment to that motion, but uh, to the uh, to the motion of Councillor Fry and Dominato, but uh, no DBL staff, and uh, and in this particular case, because uh, I have um, uh, obviously conferred with staff in the preparation of a motion on the same subject, I was informed by staff that it is not possible for any staff to proceed with work um, or preparing for such work without the Department of uh, development buildings and licensing because their uh, involvement would be so integral um, in this particular case. So I'm going to support your ruling. Okay, thank you, Councillor Carr. I don't see any vote. Councillor Boyle, uh, up to five minutes. 
some things just to say i'll also be supporting the um the ruling of the chair i think it's important that we don't just um start adding work to the january timeline of dbl that um that that respecting the moratorium and and more broadly respecting the significant work that they're doing um, to speed up permitting uh, and and really focus on that work um, is going to require us to not just from now forward add to the to do list starting January. Um, I understand the moratorium to mean that in January we could start to discuss new items and. But even then, those may need to go at the end of an existing work plan. So um, it, it makes sense to me. And I know this has been discussed in a variety of ways and there's sort of we're wrestling through what it means. But that uh, is how I hope we will interpret it. And so I, I will be supporting the um, ruling uh, of the chair. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, that's it for oh, Councillor Bly up to five. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. I just actually have a point of information to you as the chair. Yes. But we also have um, another motion on our agenda today that I'm just reviewing um, is dealing with the same issue. And um, I'm not seeing any language around staff not working on this. So I just, I'm actually just hoping to get some clarification that we expect. Are we expecting that we're going to have a similar ruling on? I just uh, th this uh, this motion, the chair challenge is only related to this item, so we'd have to wait uh, for that item to see if there is a challenge or a um, you know a complaint or something when when that item comes to the agenda because it's not on the floor. So I I just wouldn't uh, wouldn't cut. Well, let's cross that bridge when we get to it. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, uh, Mayor. Uh, just to say, um, I, I support the challenge, and and, and largely because uh, the motion's really clear that it's not to involve work of DBL at this time. It does indicate very clearly in the motion that it's to respect the moratorium which Council put in place until uh, January of 2022. And so, um, you know, from my perspective, um, that's very clear, and it was articulated uh, that way in the motion to respect the moratorium, as opposed to driving ahead and, and suggesting that this work be done now. So, uh, for that reason, some consistency, I, I support the challenge. Okay, thanks so much. And that's it for um, it. So let's uh, call a vote on this matter. And um if you so just to clarify uh, before we call the vote that if you support the chair challenge that is uh, uh you know uh, um you oppose my ruling this out of order uh then you would um vote yes that would be to support a councillor kirby young's motion and if you support if you agree with my ruling uh you would vote no Okay, Council, uh, the votes are in on that one, and we have um, that has uh, the challenge has failed with uh, seven opposition, and that is Councillor Bly, Boyle, Weeb, Swanson, Fry, Carr, and myself. Okay, thanks so much. So we're moving on to uh, item two, which is endorsing the uh, vote 16 BC campaign to lower the voting age to 16 across uh, British Columbia. And this motion is uh, moved by Councillor Boyle. So, Councillor Boyle, you have up to two minutes to uh, introduce this, and there can be questions of up to one minute after your um, after you're completed. So, up to two minutes, please go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this uh, is an issue that a, a number of young people around the province have been working on actually uh, for quite a while. Um, the Vote 16 BC campaign was endorsed by a majority of municipalities at the UBCM meeting in 2019. It's also been endorsed by a number of other organizations uh, and municipalities. Um, and there are several jurisdictions worldwide uh, that yeah. have lowered the voting age to 16 as a continued ex uh, expansion of enfranchisement. Yeah. Um, our current uh, voting rules have evolved over time um, to allow more people in, and this is a 
um, and ask that that continue. There are a number of reasons that I think it's important and many of them are outlined uh, in the motion. So I'll just say, I think we as a council in our two and a half years have sorry, seen sorry, and I heard. Do, yeah, I do have a point of order. Oh, oh, sorry, I didn't hear you. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Councilor Kirby Young, yes. I was referencing the minutes from the last council meeting and we didn't defer um, introduction of motions that what the minutes state is that council suspend the rules and waive introductions of the motions and asking questions. So my understanding was that based on that motion at the last meeting, the minutes that we would not be doing introductions or questions. It That's may have not happened because we ran out of time, but I can just double check with the clerk. Sorry about that, uh, Councillor Kirby. Uh, sorry, Councillor Boyle. I'll come right back to you. Yeah, so we're just uh, checking back in the minutes. Um, we'll be right back to you as soon as we've. Uh, it's on page 14, 14 there. I see last minutes. Thank you. Okay, Council, we're uh, reviewing the minutes with the clerk. And again, another thing that's new, uh, it does look like we suspended the rules and waiving the introduction of the member's motion. Uh, but that was for that meeting and not this meeting. So we sp suspended the rules. I think we were kind of trying to crunch everything into the time that we had. We suspended the rules for uh, the, the uh, the member's statement and the question period, but that was for that meeting. And since that was adjourned because we hit the, the deadline, we are kind of reset at this meeting. Uh, and this is uh, carried over as unfinished business. Uh, we could uh, move another motion to suspend the introductions and questions if we want to, but uh, that, that um, just talking back and forth to the clerks, uh, that, that suspension only applied to that meeting and not this meeting. So I'm just going to proceed then with uh, with uh, the uh, the regular practice here, and uh, Councillor Boyle, you have about a minute left. Thanks, Mira. I just wanted to uh, close in introducing this motion by uh, reminding Council um, in the the time that we have been in office of the. Uh, of the incredible amount of participation that we've seen by young people. Um, uh, signing up to speak, reaching out to counselors, deeply engaged in the way uh, that our decisions impact the future of the city that they care so much about. I think we have seen uh, perhaps more than any other level of government um, how 
uh, informed and engaged many young people across the city are uh, and how much the decisions that we make will impact their future. And so hope that we can uh, recognize that participation, recognize the importance of this continual uh, expansion of enfranchisement and voter rights in endorsing this campaign, which is a uh, um, an important uh, little thing we can do, won't add work to any of our staff or at any cost, but does use our, our voices to move this issue forward. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young, do you have a question? Up to one minute. No, thank you. Okay, Councillor Harbuck, up to a minute. You might be on mute. Yeah, sorry about that. I had to switch screens. Um, yes, Councillor Boy, you talk about uh, this level of government. Uh, one of my concerns is around the knowledge about different levels of government that is taught in the school system. Um, are you aware of the extent to which civics is taught in our current BC school curricula? I am. I have two kids uh, in that uh, public school system and, and one in high school who's been uh, taking civics classes just this year. Okay, well, um, it'd be very interesting to have an, a clear understanding about the extent to which civics is taught in high school. Um, my understanding and experience is that it has not been an active part of the curricula uh, for some time. Um, do you under, do you know the, the uh, concept of considered judgment in democratic theory? Uh, I doubt that in the time left I have time to adequately answer that, but we have many uh, young speakers signed up tomorrow who you could ask these questions to as well. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you. It goes fast. Uh, Councillor Carr, up to a minute. Yes, uh, thank you. Councillor Boyle, um, I note that in one of your whereas, you talk about jurisdictions like Austria, Argentina, and Scotland that have lowered the voting age to 16. I wonder if you have any um, information to share with Council about the Im uh, impact of that in terms of participation of youth or any other reports that may have arisen out of, uh, out of that particular experience. Uh, it is a great question, Councillor Carr. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I'd be happy to uh, dig up a bit of that before tomorrow. And again, I, I suspect that some of our speakers uh, would have um, would have some more specific uh, data on uh, on voter turnout and and those sorts of questions. Okay, I look forward to that. Thank you. Yes, me too. Thanks. Thanks. That's it for uh, questions uh, to the mover. Of, oh, uh, Councillor Swanson, up to a minute. That's for the next item. Okay, doke. Thanks so much. Uh, so uh, we do have speakers to this item. So if you'd like to hear from speakers, we need to refer. Second the motion. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, right. Second the motion. I missed that part. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councilor. Referral. Move referral council. Yep. So it'll be okay. tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow at nine thirty a.m. Uh, seconder, Councillor Boyle. Yep. All those in favor say yay. 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 Opposed say nay. Okay, thanks so much. That's passed. Uh, Council, we're at eleven fifty-three, so we may uh, we may get through item number three, at least the questions part. So, Councillor Swanson, you're up for uh, two minutes to introduce your motion on supporting hotel workers' rights to return their jobs at living wages. Yeah, this is just another advocacy motion to try and stick up for some of our residents who work in hotels. The hotel industry has been decimated by COVID. And as bad as it's been for business, the hotel workers, a large majority of them are racialized women, have suffered the most. The tourism is industry got government bailouts of 106 million in 2020, and then another 120 million in April. And hotels in BC and Vancouver continue to fire their employees in spite of this. In Vancouver, the Pan Pacific, Fairmont Waterfront, Park Marriott hotels permanently laid off employees because of COVID. At the Pan Pacific, close to 90% of the terminated women are racialized. The Unequal Women campaign is about bringing attention to the devastating impact of this on racialized women. The tourism industry generated billions before COVID. Women contributed 430 million in taxes annually through their tourism work. Back in September, when the province was considering extending recall rights to hotel employees, 
The BC Hotel Association CEO Ingrid Jarrett said, quote, of course, hotels will rehire employees as business returns. They're our most valuable asset. Since then, right. hotels have fired right. hundreds right. of long-term workers. The issue is when hotel workers are rehired, will they be hired at minimum wage with no benefits or will they keep the wages and benefits they had before COVID? Or will we let the hotel industry use COVID to push back wages and working conditions of mostly racialized women. So, so this is just a motion to advocate on their behalf to other levels of government and also to ensure that when we participate at, at like at the UBCM or the LMLGA, that we go to hotels where women are earning, women and men workers are earning living wages. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dejanova, up to a minute. Thanks. I just have a question for Councillor Swanson. Yep. Hi, Councillor Swanson. I'm just wondering, um, I understand that you've brought previous motions on this topic. Wondering why this was specific to hotel workers and not to all workers that perhaps uh, did not have um, assurance as to what their employment or benefits would be. Um, if we want to apply it to all workers, that's fine with me, but it's the hotel workers that are that have this campaign and have ask for our support. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. Thanks, I don't see any other questions, so we need a seconder for this. Councillor Boyle, I'm happy to second. Thanks, Sir. Councillor Boyle. We have speakers to this motion, so we need to refer it. Would somebody move to refer it to tomorrow? Move to refer, so move. Second. Okay, uh, thank you. I hear Councillor Boyle, mover, Councillor Dejanova, second. All in favor, yay. 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 Nay. Opposed, nay. Okay, thanks, Council. We're at 11.57. The next item actually doesn't have speakers, so we'll be debating and making a decision uh, for the safe passing distance for all road users motion uh, in Council today. So I suggest we just um, we break for lunch and then we uh, come back in camera between 1 and 3 and then return to Council at 3. So with that, we'll uh, let's break for lunch and we'll uh, see you in about an hour. Thanks.
Welcome to TELUS Conferencing. To join the conference, enter your Can you hear me, Anthony? I hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you.
Just making sure we've got quite a quorum there. I see one, two, three, four, five. Moving to just to refresh your memory, we've done, uh, we're on item number four, which is a safe passing distance for all road users. And the motion will be introduced by Councillor Fry with followed up by questions. Um, with Councillor Boyle seconding the motion, and there are no speakers to this item, so we'll deal with this right away. Um, so, uh, Councillor Fry, thanks, Mayor. Uh, so, this is a pretty straight-ahead motion uh, to send to UBCM by the June 30th deadline. Uh, it was brought to Councillor Boyle and I uh, from the BC Cycling Coalition, who have been uh, advocating and uh, rather successfully to Minister Ma. Um, uh, around the idea of safe passing distances for cyclists. And this is legislation that has been introduced to the Provincial um, Motor Vehicle Acts in Nova Scotia, Newfoundland and Labrador, Ontario and Quebec, uh, and they have been quite successful. And basically they're just uh, mandating uh, safe passing distances for when, when vehicles are overtaking cyclists or pedestrians. Uh, this is especially relevant at UBCM and for uh, local governments across our province where where there's a lot more sort of shared road infrastructure in particular on some of those sort of long country roads where there's uh there's not a paved shoulder and and, and it can actually create a pretty unsafe or perception of unsafe situation for cyclists and of course this council um, does support uh safe travel for uh, all road users so hoping this should be a pretty straight ahead piece to um, to pass a council um, we did have some feedback from UBCM uh, by way of a similar resolution that was put forward by North Van City, and Councillor Boyle will be uh, providing an amendment to uh, just sort of tighten some of the, the language up around the physicality of, of the distance. That's it. Okay, thank you so much. I just check here. I, I don't see any questions for you. So uh, we have Councillor Boyle has seconded the motion, so we can go on to the main queue for debate and decision um, up to five minutes. Councillor Fry, do you have anything else on this one? Uh, no, just just that Councillor Boyle will be uh, submitting an amendment uh, to, um, uh, as mentioned with the, the distance thing. Thanks. Okay, uh, Councillor Boyle, are you ready to go with that? Yes, sorry, I'm having trouble getting onto the list. Um, I put you on I, and I'll start your clock, go ahead. Okay, great, appreciate that. I have, uh, as Councillor Fry mentioned, circulated uh, an amendment to from Council that uh, is based on feedback from uh, UBCM around uh, more specificity in the passing distances. Okay, and you say you've sent, oh, there it is. Okay, I see it here. Second, Councillor Kirby. Okay, we have a seconder and I'll just move it on to the amendment queue. So if anybody wants to talk to this, just put yourself on the queue. I don't see anybody on the queue, so we'll go to a vote on this one. This is on the amendment to the uh, Councillor Fry's motion. Point of privilege, Mayor. Yes, go ahead, Councillor Desnova. Unfortunately, uh, my panel has just reloaded. So would you like a help, a vote assist? Um, Mayor, I'd also appreciate a vote assist in favor. Okay, thank you, Councillor Boyle. Clerks, if you could just mark uh, Councillor Boyle in favor. Don't know what happened to Councillor. Councillor Dejanova? Can you hear me, Mayor? I can now, yep. Uh, did you want to vote assist in favor? That's what I'd asked for, if that's okay, please. Oh uh, yeah, I didn't hear, I think you were cut off, so um, just wanted to make sure. Okay, uh, Council, that amendment passes with uh, uh, unanimously. Okay, thanks so much. So we're going back to the main queue. Uh, Councillor Boyle, anything else? I just just to say that I appreciate this is an important uh, advocacy piece, both for us and for regions across the province and uh, hope, hope to see it successful both here and at the UBCM. Okay, great, thanks so much. Uh, I don't see anybody else in the queue, so we can call a vote on the amended motion. Mayor, can I get a, a vote assist in favor again? Thanks. Yep, sure. Clerks, if you'd mark that. And same here, Mayor. 
Okay, Councillor Dejanova, mark in favor, please. Okay, um, just checking here. Great, so that uh, passes unanimously. Uh, that's item four. Safe passing distance as amended has passed unanimously. Thanks so much. We're on to um, unfinished business five, the uh, pursuing emission-free landscaping equipment in the city of Vancouver. Uh, Councillor Carr, you're up for two minutes, whenever you're ready. Uh, yep, thanks, uh, Mayor. My motion arises from two big concerns. One is people's health and quality of life, and the second is environmental concerns regarding air quality and the climate emergency. Um, and I note that the noise decibels over 80, noise levels over 85 decibels are considered harmful to health, and most landscaping equipment that is uh, fossil fuel driven is um, above that. Um, also, one hour of using a leaf blower creates pollution equal to a new car being driven 1,770 kilometers, um, including ozone, particulate matter, harmful to people and um, the environment. In 2019, both the Park Board and School Board passed motions to phase out fossil fuel landscaping equipment in our city. My motion does not direct staff to start preparing a ban. And that's because of the current moratorium on assigning, assigning work to the Department of uh, um, uh, uh, DBL. Um, I note on our agenda today, an earlier motion was ruled out of order because of this moratorium. But I just want to say on the record, I would really encourage and support Councillor Kirby Young putting forward her motion um, for that detailed plan after the moratorium is lifted. Meanwhile, my motion provides a helpful signal to the public and landscaping industry by affirming the goal of pursuing emission-free landscaping in seal in our city by 2025 and direct staff to provide input into Metrovan's draft 2021 clean air plan, urging Metrovan, which has both the authority, authority and the responsibility over air quality in our region to develop stringent emission regulations and requirements for landscaping equipment. You might note that my motion um, does talk about a deadline on the input into that plan of uh, June 15th. However, I did talk to staff at Metro Vancouver. They have um, provided a letter to us. I circulated it to all of council um, and their statement that they would be happy to receive a submission from the city of Vancouver after the June 15th date. Okay, thanks so much. That's two minutes right on the clock. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Councillor Carr? I don't see any. Can we have a seconder? Councillor Boyle, I'd be happy to second. Thank you. Uh, we have speakers tomorrow, so can we have somebody move this uh, to tomorrow? So move. Seconded. Okay, thank you. All in favor, yay? Yay. 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 Okay, uh, uh, nays? I don't hear any. Thanks very much. So that has passed and will be discussed tomorrow. Um, we have now uh, item number seven, which is issuing an official apology from the city of Vancouver to the Italian Canadian community during Italian Heritage Month in 2022. And uh, Councillor Dejanova, you have up to uh, two minutes to speak to this. Thanks very much, Ma Mayor Stewart. Um, I'm moving this motion and Councillor Dominato is seconding okay. uh, this motion. I just wanted to, to note that as we co-submitted sure. it. Um, I, 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 I hope I provided enough information in the whereas clauses. Uh, when I had originally put this motion forward, I withdrew it just to make sure uh, there were a number of facts that I wanted to include, but I also wanted to include staff's feedback, which was it would be better than doing it this year to wait and give staff that time to research. A lot of that research, I understand, has already been uh, done, uh, it, and it, it really involves a motion moved by Vancouver City Council. Um, since that period of time, and because I have limited time, the Prime Minister has issued an official apology to people who were interred and their families, um, especially uh, Italian Canadians uh, specifically. Uh, I know that we have done this for a number of communities in Vancouver. I don't think that the Italian Canadian community is any more important uh, than any other, but there was uh, huge discrimination uh, that I've heard 
I've heard from the community that they experienced and felt uh, during this time. So it's not just about those who were interred, uh, who never were charged criminally or had a chance to defend themselves. This was also about discrimination uh, for anyone who was Italian Canadian. And I just to share something personal with Council, uh, my last name, although we say Di Genova, it's actually Di Genova. And my uh, great grandfather changed the spelling of, of it uh, to DE from DI for the very reason that there was, there was a wide discrimination and he wanted it to sound less Italian uh, because of the discrimination that he and others uh, faced. So I'm um, just sharing that as a fact, but this is about the discrimination that a community faced uh, that has made huge contributions to the city of Vancouver and a Vancouver City Council motion uh, that was passed to uh, aid in moving forward to help the government in what ended up uh, being not only the internment but discrimination of many Italian Canadians. Okay, thank you so much. I don't see any questions for you at this point. And May we do I have to, to hear from speakers. Uh, we need a seconder first. A seconder for this item. Oh, we had to second, kind of Councillor Dominato. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. So, Councillor Dejanovi, you want to refer it to tomorrow? Yes, please. Seconder for that. Anyone? Second. Thank you, Councillor Dominato. All in favor? Yay. Yay. Opposed? Yay. Opposed? Nay. Great. Thanks so much. That's referred to tomorrow. Uh, the next item is uh, Vancouver Blueways cleanup by Councillor Weeb. Councillor Weeb, you have up to two minutes. Um, yeah, so the motion I'm bringing forward here is talking about a blue waste cleanup, um, which really is focusing um, the first section on endorsing the Vancouver plastic cleanup. Um, the launch was today at 2 p.m. Um, and started to with 13, well, I guess 12 sea bins um, that will be in the Falls Creek. And the goal here is to really understand the plastic that we have floating and remove plastic oils and gas from our blueways across the city. We have passed multiple initiatives to clean it up. And one of the exciting components of this motion is really working on the volunteer cleanup and the Indigenous Guardian program. And in speaking with our three host nations, one of the components I think is most important for us to do is include um, employment opportunities for First Nations to be leaders in um, monitoring and enhancing our biodiversity and our blueways and our shorelines. And I think this is a critical element that I look forward to a report back as part of our aquatic environment action plan. Um, and it's something that uh, Rena Sutar, the director of decolonization arts and culture from the park board talked about when a blue flag program was brought to park board that we need indigenous led programs that really enable us to move forward um, to have cleaner waterways and recognize the importance of the leadership and historical knowledge of how to better preserve the ecological systems we have that we call our blue ways right now. So that's why this motion is brought forward. Second, Councillor Kirby Young. Okay, thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. Uh, but we can't, we do actually have somebody on the question, uh, the list first before questions before we, uh, before we move to seconding. So, Councillor Carr, you have up to a minute for questions. Yeah, thanks. I just have one question, um, Councillor Weeb, and that is uh, regarding the authority and responsibility that is vested in the federal government um, around, around particularly um, our um, ocean waterways. Um, does your motion anticipate working with the federal government to improve their enforcement in this regard? Um, in this project, no, this is mostly the stuff that will be done on the shoreline. You put a motion forward that really talked about working with the federal government, and it is included in the whereas is on how we continue to work intergovernmentally um, to move water initiative forward. Um, this motion is more talking about how we can, from a localized government, um, working with our First Nations, protect the shorelines. Okay, thank you for that clarity. Thanks. Uh, that's it for questions. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young, you want a second? Yes, second. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, great. So uh, we have speakers. So can we have somebody move this a motion to hear it tomorrow? Refer to Move. tomorrow to hear from speakers. Thank you, Councillor Dejanova. Seconder? Boyle. Thank you, Councillor Boyle. All in favor, yay. Yay. Opposed, nay. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, last one on the unfinished business is reconnecting with Solo Fraser River. Uh, Councillor Weeb, that's for you too. 
up to two minutes. Yeah, this is another um, initiative to improve our waterfront. And this one's really been led um, by the community. There's been community work since 88 that's really been um, advancing the opportunity to do a lot of work to reconnect the Fraser, fix the issues with restoration, um, with the connection north-south, with making the north arm, um, which is an amazing trail that will connect the mouth of the Fraser all the way to Hope. Um, and the biggest element of this is working with the Musqueam Nation. Um, they've been stewards of this area um, for tens of thousands of years. And this is um, one of the most important regions in all of North America in recognizing some of the awareness that has happened on these lands and waters. And I think this is an opportunity. Um, we have a speaker tomorrow from the Musqueam Nation um, that's really going to talk about how important it is for us to work with our First Nations, but also work with the Port Authority, um, who has agreed that they will be sending someone if this gets passed. Um, Sparrow will be involved, um, as well as Metro Vancouver would like to be involved. And so this is a multi-jurisdictional element to really restore the Fraser River. Oh, right. I'm sorry. Head up to two minutes, Councillor Weave. Sorry for prompting you there. Okay, and so the goal here is how do we reconnect the city of Vancouver? There's opportunities with a lot of our action plans, but we need a proper plan that has Musqueam, the port, parks board, the Ministry of Forests, CP Rail, Metro, TransLink, and our community experts at the table to really advance this work. Um, there's a lot of piecemeal projects that have been done over the last years, and this is a huge opportunity to raise this element up there's, this has been brought forward by the community, um, and I'd like to thank all the community partners that have brought this forward, um, that some will come speak tomorrow, and just the importance of us paying attention to how Vancouver can not only better connect with Musqueam, but better connect with the Fraser and connect more residents um, to one of the most important rivers here in the world. And I think this is a huge component to overall stewardship and ecological health that we need to do for generations to come is what we could do by pulling this group together. Thanks. If you have a question from Councillor Kirby, yeah, go ahead, up to a minute. Yeah, thanks for this, Councillor Reeve. Uh, can you comment on the noted in the whereases and the staff feedback about Metro Vancouver similar effort to establish a Fraser River multi-stakeholder working group and how um, this would avoid duplication or not duplicate the creation of a similar working group? Yeah, so the larger roofing group um, is something that we've tried to champion since 2015. So that is looking at every single nation and every municipality in Metro Vancouver. That's going to take multiple years to get off the ground um, and we'll have a larger focus. This is a smaller focus, which has certain players that are involved in this specific section. So the larger regional one that is very exciting, it's probably one of the most exciting things I have seen come to Metro Vancouver. Um, will take multiple years before getting off the ground and should because it's bringing in a lot of different partners. This is a great opportunity to show how intergovernmental groups can work together. Um, another good example of what this would look like is what's happening in Boundary Bay with the Semiamu First Nation on looking how to bring back cultural clamming initiatives in Boundary Bay. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's it for questions. There are speakers on this, so. Second, Dr. Kirby Young. Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. We have a uh, mover to here tomorrow. So move. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Second. Second. Thank you, Councillor Dominato. All in favor, yay. 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 Opposed, yay. yay. Great. That's moved to tomorrow. Thanks very much. Um, okay, so we do have item number 10, uh, Council, which is a kind of a first one of these uh, that we've uh, faced on this Council. This is uh, CD1 rezoning of 3609 to 3687 Arbutus Street. Uh, on June 17th, Vancouver City Council held a public hearing on this item and following the close of speakers list and receipt of public comments, referred questions to staff debate and decisions of the council meeting held on June 22nd, that's today, as unfinished business. Oh, sorry, this is a different item. We have had these before. We're just, uh, we're just concluding the public hearing here today, council. Councillors Station Nova, Dominato, and Hardwick for absent for all or a portion of this public hearing and must review the proceedings of the meeting if they wish to vote on the application. So, Councillor Station Nova, have you reviewed the proceedings you missed and will you be voting on I, the application? I have not and I will not. Okay, thank you. Councillor Dominato? 
I have, and I will. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. I have not, and I will not. Okay, thanks. So, um, Council, we uh, we're kind of rapidly going through this item. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of time to upload it into your brain. Uh, but this is a we're at the stage in the public hearing process uh, where we're asking questions to staff on this item. I know there is a bunch of interest in it. Point of information. Uh, you need the floor for that, but uh, call it, no, just, uh, sorry. we can, uh, if I put you on the list, we can. Okay, Councillor Hardwick, you're, this, is, uh, this is questions to staff, so. Um, well, this was really a point of information to you, through you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Having, having missed the uh, public hearing, uh, should I sign off at this point? Um, uh, maybe the clerks can help us. You just won't. It's not that you're in conflict. It's just that you're not able to vote on this matter or ask questions at this stage because you. Uh, so I would just. Uh, I don't think you need to remove yourself from the chamber, but um, but leave it to the other council council uh, for this. Okay. Great. Thanks so much. Um, Council, have any questions on this one for staff? Oh, sorry. I, oh, okay. There we go. Starting to get people on here. Okay. Councillor Weeb, you have up to five minutes questions to staff. Yeah. First question is on the central courtyard. Um, can you talk about the accessibility that has been included to ensure that this space will be included for everyone? And city manager, do we have staff here to answer that? Or anybody on the staff team? Uh, this is uh, James Bolt. I'm the rezoning planner. Right. Uh, you can hear me. Um, I, I was going to ask the um, if the urban design planner could maybe uh, check in on that. Um, I don't have the uh, detailed landscape plan to be able to really get to that question. Sorry, staff, we did not give you much time to adjust between uh, items. So I understand that it might take a second. So I'll just stop Councillor Weeb's uh, Timer just to give you a second to adjust. I, I know the clerks keep reminding me, and I keep forgetting that we need a bit of time for turnover. So I'll just give you a few seconds to get. Uh, I don't think we need a recess, but I'll just give you a bit of time to get your team together. Uh, in in terms of the courtyard, the uh, the uh, there would be a requirement for accessibility. There is a uh, two elevator cores uh, in the building and therefore there would have to be uh, accessible access uh, to those elevators and and through the the entrance okay i appreciate that um second question is on the deliverance of cacs on a project like this um, how, do, how do we feel that we've captured the land lift and can you talk about how that land lift was captured and how it will be delivered in the community? Uh, in this case, uh, under the affordable housing choices uh, policy, this is James Bolt again, I'm sorry. Uh, the uh, requirement is that any project over four stories uh, so, in other words, five or six stories does require a performa analysis, which is reviewed by our uh, real estate group and our quantity surveyor. That was done. Uh, the conclusion here was that because the developer has offered uh, to secure 20% at below market uh, rents in line with our, our, uh, our requirements in the DCL bylaw, that um, there was no lift on this project. Uh, in other cases where uh, we have six story building on our zoned land, uh, we have found that there is lift and there is a CAC. In such case, 
cases, we would be looking at um, increasing the level of affordability in the project to reduce that uh, CAC. In this case, again, because the 20% was provided, our real estate staff were confident that there was no lift. So we weren't trying to negotiate like 22, like some other projects. Um, I guess one of the other comments on that is do we, is that something that we might look in the future to determine what that value is? Um, recognizing that it is a community amenity that we are looking for the affordability. So do we ever want to showcase that the CAC would have been 2.7 million and that's delivering this much affordability? Is that something that we've highlighted in the past or is that something we'd like to keep confident or confidential? Or is there no, a reason why we don't I showcase that? Oh. Hi, Council. It's Yardley Yard McNeil, uh, Assistant Director of Planning for Rezoning. We haven't shown that in the rezoning reports, although it is calculated by real estate services. And as James indicated, in this case, the whatever land lift was generated by the market rental was eaten up by the cost of securing those below, mar below market rental units. In the future, if Council is, is, um, is wishing this, we can certainly include that information in Council reports in the future. So you get a sense of what the value and the cost of delivering below market rental units would be. Yeah, I think that'd be helpful. And then the last one, are those units um, held um, in perpetuity? So are they held to the unit or are they held to the renter? It, it's um, not. They're held, they're held to the unit. Actually, it's Yardley again. They're held to the unit so that if a tenant that's in a below market rental unit decides to move out, that the unit is um, uh, contained as a below market unit or substituted for one similar within the building. And in that approach is really to allow people to kind of make life decisions of staying in the building or not, or their income may change over time as well. And remember, these tenants have to qualify for a below market rental unit, which the city regulates. But are they rent controlled? Sorry, that's uh, you're, you're at the uh, five minutes. So, uh, Councillor Bly, up to five. Thanks very much. I'd actually appreciate hearing the response from staff on that uh, about the the um, the rents in the below market units, if they are how long that they'll be guaranteed in perpetuity. Okay. Did you have other questions? Yeah, I wasn't sure if staff wanted to. Council, we ran out of time, so I'm not sure if staff oh. wanted. To that's what I'm okay, sure. they'll do. Yeah. Thanks. Hello, Councillor Bly. This is Angel, housing planner working on this project. Um, I just wanted to clarify as well that so um the below market, 20% below market component of this project actually does mirror our moderate income rental housing pilot program. So those are all the same rents um, secured in perpetuity. Um, so rent control units. Um, so essentially the same as uh, one of our, our Merck projects, which you're, you're familiar with. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I just have a couple of other questions. There was some concerns raised around just in um, thinking about our transportation updates this morning, but there were concerns raised around um, accessible, safe um, um, crosswalk or available cross crossings um, from where this building will be located to the Greenway. And I'm just wondering if staff um, contemplated this and I thought that um, there may be uh, anticipated uh, recommendations or updates to make a safe crossing um, somewhere close to where this uh, building may go if it's approved. Hi, Council. It's Yardley McNeil again from uh, Assistant Director of Planning. We didn't, engineering did not indicate in the course of their review of this application that there needed to be a controlled crosswalk at this location connecting it to the Arbutus Greenway. Um, this is a full block place, uh, block face site, and it is within a couple of blocks distance of uh, a signal crosswalk to the north. And we don't have anything in the report that indicates that in, it, anything other than that is, is required. Okay, that's good to know. Um, I wonder if uh, staff can reflect on the sort of broader uh, plan for this particular corridor on our view, recognizing that there's a number of properties that are either being assembled or have um, perhaps closed and what we can anticipate in terms of future rezonings and planning for this particular area, recognizing we're in a broader citywide plan and also um, the, the plan at 
itself, if you can clarify if there's something specific that contemplates this particular stretch of Arbutus. Uh, right, Yardley again. At this point, the, there are tentative plans um, underway with our housing policy group that are coming to council this fall, and it's under the amendments to the secured rental housing policy, and it will provide opportunities for RS and RT lots to develop market rental, and in some instances, in addition to below market rental, there, that work is still underway. Um, Arbutus Corridor is certainly one of the areas they're looking at, and we would anticipate the council would um, see that in, in a fulsome way by this fall. Okay, great. Um, so further to that, uh, a number of callers raised concerns around traffic, recognizing that this is on a, um, of course, we've already spoken about the Greenway, but also the, um, the Broadway uh, uh, subway to Arbutus is, is right there in a, a well-used um, transit corridor. Uh, what are staff's thoughts initially around both this project, but also the broader planning around um, traffic management? Uh, James Blitz here, uh, rezoning planner. Um, the, the, uh, we had the traffic consultant at the public hearing from the, uh, from the architect, but uh, the summary of those findings are in the report. And what it was found is there was a very nominal increase uh, in traffic with this uh, project. Um, I think it was about a 1% increase at peak times uh, through the lane and on Arbutus Street, uh, which staff in consultation with engineering staff uh, concluded was, was uh, pretty reasonable. I would also know that this is a this is a pilot project, and the project pilot project is now closed. Uh, so a lot of this was testing those kind of uh, situations and what the impacts were. Uh, moving forward, as Yardley noted, with the, the secured rental policy, there might be more um, more work done on that uh, in these corridor areas. Okay, okay. I'm I'm just out of my time there, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Carr, up to five minutes, or yeah, up to five. Great. Thanks, Mayor. And so, uh, first of all, I just want to reflect on some of the quite, or some of the issues posed by the speakers that we had. And um, one of them was around access um, for cyclists to the Arbutus Greenway from the site, noting that it that's cited as one of the advantages of, um, of being close to the Arbutus Greenway is obviously it's there, but access they noted was very, very difficult. Um, any plans around that? Uh, this is James Bolt again. As Yardley noted, um, engineering uh, has, we didn't get any specific comments on this project because it was just a singular, you know, we were looking just at the site. Uh, that would be a part of the future planning in the area, but right now they, they would have to uh, go up to the, the lights um, Right. at King Ed or 30th to get over to Arbutus. Okay, or so to the Greenway, four, yeah. four blocks or so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, another, um, there was a, a number of speakers who raised issues around parking. They didn't feel there was enough parking um, you know, within the, the project and that people would be parking on the street. I wonder if um, engineer can provide some analysis of, of that issue and, and why if they don't ant anticipate it being a problem. Uh, this is uh, James Bolt again, rezoning. I don't believe we have uh, engineering staff here at the moment, but uh, the project will comply with the parking bylaw provisions. Uh, and we did not hear of any concern from our engineering staff on uh, parking in the area, which is primarily uh, single family. There might be some uh, modest uh, localized impact right around the building, uh, but uh, the the project will comply with the parking bylaw. Okay, um, and fi the final question raised um, uh, by again speakers is uh, the their fear that uh, development like this might cause housing the value of their homes and housing housing prices to fall. Um, I wonder if there has been any analysis around that or if there's any validity to that kind of argument, given this um, this is a six-story development. 
Uh, James Bolt again. We we don't have real estate staff here, but it's been uh, in when this issue has come up in the past, uh, we've reminded people that throughout this city uh, we have single family housing backing onto uh, C zone projects for five six story development, and we haven't seen any um, impact on on property values, uh, particularly on the west side. Okay, good to know. Thank you. That's it for my questions. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Bly, I see you back on the queue, but you just have about well, three seconds left. Councillor Bly. We'll move on to Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. A couple of follow-up questions for staff. Um, just wonder if you can reaffirm, I know it was noted that um, stated in the presentation that the proponents voluntarily offering 20% of the floor area at below market rents, which is beyond what the affordable housing choices interim policy required. What was the requirement for that policy? Can you just refresh? Uh, James Bolton rezoning. Uh, there is no requirement for below market component for affordable housing choices. Uh, the developer offered that as described in the report when staff were looking at what to consider for the maximum height of the building, those the policy permits six, um, and initially there was a thinking it might maybe should be five. The developer offered the 20% below market if they could get six stories, and staff said that would be on balance. Uh, um, you know, we would look at that as a as a good uh, offering. Um, so that was how that 20% came about. Okay, that's helpful in terms of that. Um clarification on process. Um, there's also mentioned in the report, a 17 foot space to be dedicated to the city for the walkway. And I wonder if you can just again, refresh and clarify on that in terms of um, the benefit of that and how that's gonna be utilized in terms of the impact to transition through, through and around the building or to um, surrounding neighbors. Yeah, James Bolt again, the, there is a 17 foot building line all along Arbutus. Um, in rezonings or subdivisions, uh, the city will take that as a dedication. And uh, then over time, uh, that once, you know, there's uh, all the dedications might be taken, then there's an opportunity to relook at the whole uh, street into the public realm. In this case, uh, in the interim, the, the, the boulevard would be designed with engineering staff and we would have wider sidewalks and, and trees for that stretch. If one looks at our Butis village south of, uh, I think it's 30th there, or sorry, well, sorry, not south of 30th, but our Butis village to a couple blocks in the south, one can see that where that uh, public realm has been improved with that building line having been taken. Okay, but we're quite different, I guess, in the Arbutus Village where the buildings literally feel like they're towering over the sidewalk, maybe why, but the building massing is very significant and does feel like they're towering over people. Would you say that's quite a, quite a different context just due to the sheer massing and how close that feels? Yeah, it's a different context. And until the um, these dedications would be taken there at up to that point, there would be uh, no specific plan other than what would typically be done for developments where the, where we have the wider building line. So that would be uh, wider sidewalks, further away from the curb for safety and trees, possibly a double row of trees. And then beyond that, you would have a walkways into the site uh, to the ground units and the entrance of the building. Okay, and then the final, so last question, with respect to the concerns raised by residents worrying about shadowing on adjacent properties with the difference in scale between um, this proposed building and the single family homes. You mentioned a step back to the east. Can you sort of comment any other specifics around shadowing in the shadow study to address some of those concerns that we heard? Yes, yeah, we, we've, uh, they, we required the building to step up towards our beauty to the east as shown in the report. And that was to uh, mitigate both shadowing and overlook as much as possible. The advantage with this site is that uh, there will be some impact in the morning, of course, because the sun will swing up from the east, but the properties that are affected are all to the west or just to the north of the site, and therefore there wouldn't be any shadowing in the afternoons at, at any uh, point in the year. Um, and the properties on the other side of 
the Arbutus Greenway and East Boulevard are very far away. So uh, we we felt that this project did a really good job addressing that and that the impacts would be relatively modest given what's you have, a you know, you are going to have a six story building there. So residents shouldn't worry that they're going to be cast in shadow, so to speak, and, and certainly mm -hmm. not um, in the afternoon, so even on the equinox. Not in the afternoons. There will be some shadowing impacts in the morning, uh, but not in the afternoons. Okay, thank you very much. Mayor, you might be muted. Sorry about that. Uh, we're done with questions. So can we have a mover for the report? Move, Councillor Carr. Thank Second you. Councillor Bly. Thank, thank you, Councillor Bly. Okay, we're on debate for this item now. If anybody would like to join the queue, please do now. Councillor Swanson, up to five minutes. Yeah. I'm going to go for this. It's got EV charging, it's got pet friendly, it's got vacancy control and 20% of the units. And um, I don't think it's going to gentrify that area. I think most of the units that are going in will be cheaper than what's surrounding it. So that's where I'm landing. Thank you, Councillor Swanson. Councillor Carr, up to five. Yes, um, I agree with all the points raised by Councillor Swanson, so I won't need to repeat them. I just want to, want to also add that um, I think that uh, that the voluntary commitment to provide the 20% of units at below market um, is very welcome within this city. I also appreciate the extensive landscaping and privacy screening uh, that has been built into this project and uh, the shared uh, residence uh, terraced areas. So um, I'm, I'm quite uh, pleased with uh, how there has been a sensitivity to fitting into the neighborhood. So uh, for those reasons, I felt happy about um, both moving and voting for this. Okay, thanks. Councillor Boyle. Thanks, I just wanted to uh, say how important I think it is that we build secure market rental and secure below market rental uh, in, in all neighborhoods. We heard from a number of speakers who were connected to UBC or had grown up in the neighborhood and could no longer afford to live there about the need for um, more affordable housing options in this neighborhood. Uh, and this project um, is one important way that we fulfill that. Of course, we also need more non-market housing, but I think the inclusion of the 20% below market units vacancy controlled is, uh, is a great form of CAC. I'm really glad to see that having been part of this project um, and the secure rental housing is important. It's great that uh, I, I think hopefully this passes and it will be great to have so many more residents and families be able to live so close to the Arbutus Greenway, uh, which is um, a, a lovely public amenity uh, that right now um, uh, it has a lot of low density housing around it. So really glad to see this uh, hopefully move forward and to be able to support it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Bly. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, I agree with uh, all of the comments so far by um, uh, previous councillors on this. So I won't, I won't uh, repeat those um, comments other than to say, I look forward to staff bringing forward updates to the secured rental policy. I think that there's a real opportunity uh, particularly with the subway coming in and the greenway um, established and well used. Um, I remain a, a concerned with um, the sort of um, pedestrian safety and um, accessibility to the greenway. I know this area very well. I've lived in this neighborhood for 25 years. Um, and my fear is that there will be people who will be trying to run across Arbutus um, to get to the greenway because it is right there and the sidewalks are extremely narrow. So um, with a broader policy in the or policy context for this particular area, I, I hope that we uh, just contemplate what those options really are, uh, recognizing that that can be quite a, um, a busy um, roadway and um, we want to be sure people are able to access the greenway as quick as can be as it's going to be far more preferred than the sidewalk that is already there. So, um, but I think with uh, the 
um, ability to expand rental options market and below market for this particular um, community, I think is really fantastic. And uh, I've heard overwhelming support. Of course, there are people who are uh, residents who are concerned and I understand that in terms of change. Um, but I actually think that this is going to be a really positive project um, and look forward to seeing it come to fruition. Thanks, uh, Councillor Dominato, up to five. Uh, thanks, Mayor, and um, thanks to staff and um, to all the speakers who came and spoke. Um, appreciate that, um, as Councillor Bly just noted, that there were some concerns raised uh, by some neighbours and residents. Uh, but overall, um, in terms of the speakers, I, I heard some really broad support for this proposal, um, both in terms of the secure rental component, but also the diversity of housing uh, and choices. And appreciate that the applicant uh, voluntarily um, offered uh, putting in the 20% below market component. Um, uh, that's something that we've talked about as a council as a need. Um, but one of the things that really struck me uh, with this project uh, and proposal uh, is that in, in hearing from residents, we really heard from a diversity of individuals, individuals who had grown up in the neighborhood, some were still living in the neighborhood, some were renting, some were not, but would have liked to have come back. Others were business owners uh, in the area and, and others were neighbors and, and um, I, what strongly I heard was the opportunity, um, the word vibrancy came up a number of times in terms of the, the opportunity that not only does this provide, will this provide much needed housing and, and choices for people, but it will also help reinvigorate um, the neighborhood as well and present new opportunities um, as new residents come in and that, that will support um, the community as well as, as uh, small businesses. So. Um, I was pleased to hear that. Uh, it was a bit of a different tenor for this project, so I'm happy to support it and uh, thank uh, the applicant and staff for the work on this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Councillor Fry. Thanks, Mayor, and I'll uh, keep it quick. I'll also uh, be uh, supporting this happily. Um, I was actually up that way on Sunday and uh, my mom lives up that way uh, on the other side of 16th and I, took a Moby back to East Van and it took me 20 minutes on a clunky Moby bike. Uh, so it's just, you know, it's fantastically accessible by, by way of the Arbutus Greenway. And, uh, and there's lots of great transit up that way as well. I will, uh, and of course, as others have noted, the subway coming sort of underscores that. Um, on where my mom lives, uh, there's a, it's on the north side of 16th, there's a fair amount of density in a lot of those sort of single family homes, that sort of Kitsilano infill style. So there's, already quite a bit of density, but what I've noticed over the last few years is as the increase in, in higher built form along Arbutus has, has come in and there's a lot more apartments and condos, uh, it's brought some really fantastic street level um, retail opportunities. And there's new little cafes and shops and the, the Loblaws supermarket there. And it's really actually really improved the vibrancy of what I would say was a somewhat more abundant part of town at, at one point. So. I think that where there may be some anxiety from residents over over this, I think it's actually a good fit, and I think time will 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 show that in fact you know this this building will be a nice fit, and of course because it's achieving that level of affordability that we struggled to to see in the city, and it, it obviously we would like to see more, but I think the twenty percent with vacancy control is still a good deal. Uh, I note that Prince of Wales School is is like blocks away from there, so it's a it's a great school catchment as well. Uh, and an opportunity for family housing on the, on the west side. So I'm super supportive of this. Happy to see it go forward. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Um, I appreciated all sort of the great interest in their neighborhood from the local residents and the questions that came forward. And, you know, housing and home, it's really homes, right? Where you live is really um, significant and meaningful to people, especially when you've been in a neighborhood for some time. Um, and so it naturally raises questions. And I appreciated the ones that were raised, um, which are important. Uh, with respect to traffic in and out of the site and shadowing and that having asked a number of those questions of staff i'm fairly confident that there's a number of measures put in place to be addressed and this is fairly gentle um, in terms of six stories and is on sort of a the more major street of arbutus i'm very familiar also with the neighborhood i used to live at 12th and vine just one block west of arbutus um, and was bounded by was in a four story and was bounded by a single family home um, on two sides um, and, and also a park. And it did create, I think, some diversity in the neighborhood. I'm very conscious of just the cost 
a lack of affordability of housing in the city. Um, I have left this neighborhood now. So there's no way um, that I would be able to buy a single family home and I'm not alone in that. Um, we know that half of our population renters and that's going to grow and quality secured rental is really important. Um, and we're getting 114 units here. Um, it's also really significant when some of those units, somebody can pay 950 per studio instead of 1800 um, or 1600 versus 2800. Um, when you start to look at the population on the west side and notably in the sort of large attract single family home areas, it's the one, they're the few parts of the city that we see population declining, which means that the small businesses have trouble surviving and keeping customers and they have problem getting workers. So you don't have um, people that are able to sustain the services in your neighborhood um, or they have to, they're going to take jobs somewhere else. So they have to travel and endure longer periods or, you know, we heard from kids like the kids that grew up there can't stay in the neighborhood and they have to move elsewhere um, or they want to move elsewhere, not just because they can't afford it, um, but because some of those additional services are there. So I think, you know, that's the council's job is sort of to try to hear that feedback and balance it. I will agree wholeheartedly with Councillor Bly, also being very familiar with this area, that absolutely people are gonna dart across Arbutus. Um, it's just, they're not gonna walk two blocks um, to cross the street and get to a signal light. And so, you know, I'm gonna, you know, rally um, in support of that comment and emphasize that because I think that there is some work that needs to be done um, on that street with respect to that. I've seen it happening now with people sort of trying to dart back across to get into their neighborhood. Um, and that's before sort of additional welcoming additional new people in. And I think that's that's really important. It's challenging even where there are pedestrian pathways coming off the walkway, not let alone where they are not. So I would encourage staff to really take a look at that. Um, but all of that on balance, um, I will support it for the reasons stated. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see uh, anybody else in the queue to speak to this item. So let's move to the let's move to the vote. Councillor Dejanova and Hardwick should be marked as absent clerks. Great, thank you very much. That has passed unanimously. Thanks, Council. Uh, we are at four o'clock, uh, scheduled to stop at five. Um, the next items we're dealing with are the two reports that were held by uh, Councillor Kirby Young. Uh, the first one is the uh, contract award for provision of parking meter equipment. And I believe staff have a presentation on this. Uh, am I correct, City Manager? That is correct, uh, Mayor Stewart, we do. Okay, great. So maybe- um... Can I ask a point of procedure prior to commencing that? Sure, yep. Um, and just to your point around the fact that we have an hour, um, I wanna be efficient with time. I do have an amendment that I sent in to refer this report back to staff. And I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity with the will of council, if they'd like to hear the report or not, or just proceed with considering the amendment to refer it. Would that be an appropriate time to ask that question? Or should we, do we need to go ahead and- uh, You could, um, you could, uh, you could move a motion to uh, waive uh, the uh, the presentation. Uh, I um, there may be questions, so you know I don't think we can barrel right ahead to just the amendment. So I think it's possible for you to ask if any councilors want to see the presentation. Is that yeah, we can do that. Um, so does anybody from council wish to see the presentation? I don't see, I, it, maybe not everybody's on video, but if anybody does, I, I don't hear anybody speaking up. So maybe we can move right to questions then. So okay. Councilor Kirby, can I put you on for questions? And if you have any? Yep, thank you. Yeah. I actually would just like to move the amendment. I'm just recognizing we're trying to be efficient with our time that I sent to the clerk. I'm just gonna give a second here for any other counselors to get on the list for questions. Uh, and just I, a point of procedure, Mayor, do we need to move the report first? We uh, are still in the questions period, and uh, so I, you know, I've, I've left a few seconds here, 30 seconds for folks to get on the list. I don't see anybody on the list, so then I'd have the report moved then. Um, it is, Mayor, I was on the queue. It is to clarify to Council Wise question of referral motion. I don't know if that requires it be moved first. Yeah, all motions have to be moved first. Okay. 
Yep, so we move the motion and we have a seconder. Second, Councilor Bai. Okay. Right, okay, so now we, uh, now Councilor Kirby Young, we're in the debate session and you can, section and you can uh, go ahead up to five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, so hoping the clerk has had a memo that was sent in before lunch, um, around lunchtime and can bring that up. Um, and it's simply a straightforward referral amendment that says that the contract award for the provision of parking meter equipment recommendation be referred to staff to enable inclusion on a future in camera agenda in order to provide the opportunity for council to consider questions and matters appropriately dealt with in that forum. And just for council's benefit, I have run that by staff to ensure that they felt that was in order and received an affirmation on that. Yep, okay. I'm happy to second. Okay, I'm just gonna make sure that it's up on so everybody can see here. Okay. I don't hear. Uh, That's it, Mark. Yeah. Okay, so we've seconded. So now we're on the amendment queue. Does anybody wish to speak to this uh, amendment referral, referral amendment? I don't see anybody on the queue, so we can vote on this, on this now. Councillor Hardwick. There we go. Okay, uh, that's unanimous council. So that uh, motion has been referred. Okay, we now, uh, I hear, nope, didn't hear anybody there. Okay, um, that, sorry, I heard somebody there. Maybe I didn't. Uh, next one is the uh, grant allocation that was also held by Councillor Kirby Young. We also have a presentation for this one. Um, would anybody like to see the presentation? Okay, maybe we can just move to questions then, Councillor Kirby Young. I've got you on the queue for questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm looking for some clarification from staff with respect to funding um, and just trying to reconcile a couple of questions because it references that the source of funding is the downtown Eastside capital grant program. And yet there are a couple of award recommendations in here, such as $20,000 for EPS and another for peer support workers development, I believe for rain city that would appear to me to not be capital expenses, but operating. So I'm looking for clarity on that first, please. Uh, good afternoon, mayor and council, Tom Wanklin. Can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can. Please go ahead. Um, Tom Wanklin, Senior Planner. Um, thanks for the opportunity to answer there. Um, the Downtown Eastside Capital Grants have been brought before you, sourcing from the Capital Grants Funds. When we had the, the, the report ready for submission, we were brought to uh, notice by Arts, Culture and Community Services that there are some urgent grants that they would like to uh, request your approval uh, dealing with women's safety and community stewardship um, linked to the uh, Overdose Prevention Society and work in, in the downtown east side. Those funds are separate and come from uh, provincial government uh, funding that was provided for those purposes. So where is that reflected in the report, please? Because I don't see that in the language of the recommendation, for example, in A. Okay. Um, if you allow me just a couple of seconds to quickly have a look. Sure. Yep. Um, Councillor, it is, it's Paul Mokri well, here, City Manager. It is addressed in the financial section as well as the details um, in the strategic analysis section. It speaks to the funding sources for each of those different grants. That's okay. correct. And also recommendation D, it also connects it to the source of funds, province of British Columbia. Is that 100% provincial cost recovery for those two specific cited ones, the OPS and I think it's the Rain City Peer Worker Development? Um, Mary Claire Zach indicated that she wasn't available to come to council at this time. Um, but my understanding is that those funds are, there, there is additional funding involved. Okay, uh, I've seen language on page seven of the report, for example, it says, staff recommend grants the following amounts to disperse funds received in the province of BC to CAT and does not impact the capital grants program. So does, do we interpret that as being 100% then? Yes. 
Okay. That's my understanding, Councillor, as well, yes. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Um, my other question quickly is around the shift from Vancouver Economic um, and the recommendation, wherever it is, um, to the Community Impact Real Estate Society. Yes. Um, I feel like we're playing hot potatoes with um, Vancouver Economic. Why are we moving and shifting that over from them? What, what we have uh, done in this program is worked with uh, uh, Vancouver Economic Commissioner as an implementation partner. And uh, as a result of the, we were advised by VEC that they were changing their staff resource uh, allocations to include staff on the Vancouver city plan process. And as a result, they would prefer to be advisors to continue on the project as advisors rather than project manage. So we negotiated uh, with one of the partners. Okay, thank you. So it's costing the city more money to do it then because presumably that would have been for existing staffing resources at VEC? It, it was not costing anything more to the downtown Eastside Capital Grant. But it's 25,000 that could have been used for something else if VEC had continued to do the work as it was originally planned. No, th those funds were not being used by VEC for their staff costs, that they were channeling that fund into the work being done by the consultants on the project. I'm sorry, I'm not clear on the answer. So VEC was were holding the grant funding and managing the project using that fund to pay the consultants doing the work. So you said that VEC was channeling their staff to something else, but now you're saying VEC was using a consultant? For the project, there, yeah, there is a, a round, Mayor, while I stop time. Can I move for a second round, please? Sure. Seconder. Just in under the wire there. Seconder. Seconder. Second. Second. All in favor say yay. 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 Opposed nay. Great. We got a second round, but Councillor uh, Kirby Young, we've got Councillor Dominato in the first round here, and then we'll come back to you. Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Mayor. And, um, I just have a question with respect to uh, the $20,000 allocation to OPS for de-escalation work. I um, appreciate the report um, identifies that some of those funds will be used uh, to evaluate um, the this work. I'm just curious, given that council referred a motion around looking at de-escalation strategies um, in the city and, and um, will the evaluation of this de-escalation work be used to inform um, potentially a broader de-escalation strategy that that motion contemplated? Um, or will it be only to evaluate the, that program and, and that initiative related to the OPS? I can only take it on face value, Councillor. It's Tom Wanklin speaking. Um, the I can take that question back to Arts, Culture and Community Services to confirm. But my understanding is, as it is written in the report, it's for that particular uh, project. Okay, yeah, I, I would appreciate. Um, I, I appreciate your suggestion of taking it back as a consideration to uh, because I, I think that that motion was referred, and I think if we're going to be um, providing some money for uh, evaluation of that program, maybe there's some findings that can be extrapolated um, towards other work uh, in other neighborhoods. So um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Councilor Kirby Young, back on five minutes. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. And back to you, Tom. I want to give you a chance to answer that question, just clarifying around consulting, consultant versus BEC staff. It was a bit confusing. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, planning and Vancouver Economic Commission conceptualized and established the um, uh, affordable spaces program. And right. with Council's approval, $50,000 uh, were allocated for the purposes of um, appointing a team of specialists that would assist us and to, to do the work, the EEC offered to be project managers. And that first phase was successfully completed. And uh, we came to council for a second phase, um, which was approved by council to now continue to do the work and we were subsequently advised by VEC that because of the van plan um, uh, demand on resources that and the rearrangement of their, their 
resources. They would prefer to be advisors, but not to actually be involved in the day-to-day -day project management. Um, so as a result, we are asking if council would agree that we can uh, reallocate that approved funding to a project, uh, other project implementer being CRES, Community Impact Real Estate Society. Okay, and have they done similar work or projects for the city before? They are specialists in real estate work. They are a BC housing established nonprofit agency that manages the, res the real estate portfolio for BC housing in the downtown east side. Okay. As a, non as a nonprofit. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Uh, I don't see any other questions. So, will somebody move this uh, report? So move, Councillor Carr. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Councillor Boyle seconded. Thank you. Do we have uh, Do we have uh, anyone who'd like to speak to this item? We're in the debate and decision section. I don't see anybody on the queue. So I'm going to move to a vote. If anybody needs a vote assist, let me know. Councilor Kirby Young. Uh, that's uh, passed unanimously. Thank you, Council. Okay, we're at 413, Council. Uh, why don't we give staff a chance? We've got quite a different uh, report here. Where the next one is the referral report on uh, item number four, 1850 Main Street. So why don't we just take five minutes and stretch and come back at 418. And let staff switch over. Okay, thanks.
everybody with what we're considering. Uh, this is now, uh, we're gonna, gonna consider referral report four, which a uh, reminder, staff are not recommending for referral to public hearing. Just wondering if any uh, member wishes to declare a conflict of interest on this item. I don't hear anybody, so I'm gonna move along. So uh, we have uh, Teresa O'Donnell, the general manager of planning, urban design, and sustainability here to present uh, on this item. And then we can ask uh, questions to uh, staff. And then we are gonna hear from the applicant. Again, council, this is the item. We've never really had one of these before uh, come to council. So um, you will be able to ask questions uh, to uh, staff. And um, I'll just kind of keep you in the lane. We're not really supposed to talk about the virtues of the project, but whether or not we should refer this to public hearing. So uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Teresa O'Donnell. Thank you, Mayor. Um, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. This is Teresa O'Donnell, the General Manager of Planning, Urban Design, and Sustainability. Um, not sure, I thought maybe our city manager wanted to make a couple of remarks before the staff got started on our presentation. Yeah, thanks, Teresa. I'll, I'll defer to you and, and I may wrap up, but yeah, you, I'll, I'll let you go ahead, thanks. Okay, thanks so much, Paul. Okay, so uh, thank you for your attention this afternoon. As the mayor noted, this is um, somewhat unusual for staff not to recommend referral of the zoning case, so I'd I'd like to make a brief presentation just to orient council to the case. As the mayor um, said, the applicant does have an opportunity to speak when staff makes a recommendation not to um, not to move the case forward. And I believe our applicant is here and on the call today. So just quickly, a little bit about the case. Uh, the site is located in the at the southeast corner of Maine and Second in the Mount Pleasant neighborhood is located within the Mount Pleasant community uh, plan. And the existing zoning on the site uh, today is industrial or the IC1, IC2, excuse me. The, um, go ahead, team. Uh, the proposal does comply with the Mount Pleasant plan. It's an 11 story project with ground floor retail. It's, uh, it contains 130 units of market rental housing with ground floor retail, height is about 107 feet with an SFR at just over five. And the applicant is not proposing a CAC in either the form of cash or on, or on site below market rental. And the applicant will be seeking a DCL waiver valued at approximately uh, $2.39 million. Next slide. As the staff conducted our policy review of this report, uh, the particular policy that uh, the, staff, the report, the application doesn't comply with is financing growth. Uh, these are the policies that are critical to financing growth and providing the benefits necessary to support growth. They're long-standing policies that have been adopted by council. They're published on our website. Both staff and the development industry use this well-established framework to guide the evaluation of rezoning applications. Now, specifically, when we talk about the community amenity contribution policy, that does set out the policy to secure public benefits from rezoning. The city seeks a contribution in the, fact, in the form of cash or in-kind amenity uh, to support the delivery of those public benefits. Uh, a couple of common examples of that, as, as council knows, is the provision of on-site affordable housing. That's one common method. The other one is a, ca a cash contribution. That cash is then collected through uh, the capital plan process and used to fund those offsite benefits, such as the renewal of, a, renewal of a community center. The Mount Pleasant plan, it does anticipate at least 7,000 new residents and about 3,000 new jobs by 2040. And there are sites identified in, through that plan for increased high mm -hmm. density along with those housing objectives. But the CAC is an identified mechanism for securing growth related infrastructure and amenities uh, cash to support the delivery of growth, uh, the growth of related amenities. Now this site, this site is subject to a negotiated CAC. 
The real estate staff analyzed the performa and they determined that the increase in FSR and the change from industrial to residential does indeed generate a land lift. However, the application does not include any below market rental units or a cash CAC offer. Therefore, the application does not comply with the CAC policy. Now this next slide, we've done a kind of a quick analysis of all of the rental rezoning applications uh, since 2017. And these are all of the 100% rental applications just like this one. Uh, and what you see here is uh, 56 projects. Uh, the red dots are the 27 projects. Those are small projects, typically under six stories. Those projects are exempt uh, from CAC and they don't go through a performa review. The orange dots, there are 13 of those. They're not exempt. They do undergo, they did, all of those did undergo a pro forma review. However, that analysis concluded that there was no lift generated from those projects. And then the green dots, the 16 remaining ones, those are all 100% rental rezoning that went through the pro forma analysis and a lift was established. And the CAC was used uh, in all of these cases to embed below market rental, uh, below market units in these buildings. Okay, so next slide. So in summary, uh, the application, while it is generally consistent with the Mount Pleasant plan in terms of high density and form of development, it does not comply with the city CAC policy. Staff has concluded that the rezoning from industrial does generate the capacity for a $4.4 million CAC with the DCL waiver of 2.39 million. Therefore, staff cannot support this case and we recommend that uh, council not refer this to public hearing. Okay. And then this last slide, we wanted to make sure that we were laying out the clear options that the council has in this case today. The council can refer the application to public hearing or they can refuse the application, not send it forward to public hearing, or they can refer the application back to staff with specific instructions. So now, also if the council does determine uh, to send this case forward to public hearing, the council, again, at public hearing, after they've heard from the speakers, also have three act, uh, options there, to approve the, the CD1 in principle with the conditions of approval or to refuse it, uh, the application, based on the staff recommendation or to refer it back to staff with, um, with instructions. So with that counsel, um, I'm happy to answer any questions and I believe our applicant is here and prepared to make some remarks himself. Okay, thanks so much, uh, counsel. Um, I think the best thing to do now is to, is to get all the information out first, and that is to have the applicant uh, present. We have uh, Hanny Lamem here from uh, Cressy Development, and then we'd have an opportunity to ask uh, questions to both the staff and the applicant in the same round. And if we don't uh, have enough time, we can always get a um, we can always get a second round. So uh, perhaps we can move to hearing from the applicant now. Do we have uh, Hanny Lamem on the uh, line? Yes, I am here. Thank you. Right. Yeah, go ahead. How you know? Just take your time and and uh, make your case. Just trying to figure out how to share my screen. Okay. Yep, we can see it now. I'm just checking to make sure it's on the public. Yep, it's on both screens. So whenever you're ready. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, again, it's just a little bit more background again about the application to review some of the details. Uh, this application began in 2015. Uh, the subject property is located at uh, the southeast corner of Main and 2nd. Needless to say, this is a very prominent high profile corner location. The proposal is for 130 units of for-profit affordable rental housing, plus some retail at grade. Uh, the application is in full compliance with the provisions of the Mount Pleasant Community Plan. We are not asking for any extra density and uh, yeah, there's, there are very few, there are no negatives really associated with the application. There's no displacement of any existing rental housing. Um, basically, this is as harmless as and in, innocuous as an application gets. 
The only disagreement between staff and the applicant is with respect to the community made contribution. And it's not like the application lacks in its contributions to public benefits. We are proposing to secure all 130 units as market rentals for 60 years for the life of the building. This is a specific public benefit that was identified in the Mount Pleasant Community Plan, uh, but more on that later. Initial rents for the rental units would be capped at the uh, east side BCL waiver rates. We would be contributing a new stormwater connection to Guelph Park into the stormwater system. Guelph Park, also known as uh, Dew Chilling Park, is located six blocks away from our proposed development. Other offsite improvements include installing new electrical and communication duct tanks for the city, making a $75,000 cash contribution for future installation of a pedestrian signal at East Third and Main, and the undergrounding of uh, surrounding utilities. Specifically, the Mount Pleasant Community Plan includes the, the following policy directive in section 4.1. It says, seek to reduce barriers to the construction of new rental market housing and provide more market rental housing in Mount Pleasant. Please also note that the following quotes uh, come directly from the Mount Pleasant Community Plan Im implementation package. First quote, the city's rental 100 program provides incentives to encourage new secured market rental housing and is anticipated to add to the inventory of secured market rental units in the community. Second quote. Uh, can you, can you have, uh, are there slides supposed to be moving or are we just uh, on? No, no, we're, still, we're, we're still on the first slide okay. here. Okay, thanks. Um, second quote, 10 year direction, encourage secured market rental development in apartment areas throughout through the Rental 100 program and associated incentives. Your, uh, your sound is breaking up a little housing bit. Um, another quote, key priorities noted in the approved Mount Pleasant Community Plan that relate to public benefits include adding affordable housing, including both market and non-market rental. So this is what we relied upon when we undertook to do this project uh, in 2015. So you know, basically we disagree with the uh, proposal's ability to make an additional CAC contribution beyond the previously described public benefits. The problem lies with the interpretation of the CAC policy and its various iterations and the CAC implementation package. Now remembering that our, our application was commenced in 2015. Before January, 2020, the CAC policy stated that for negotiated CACs, the CAC should be identified through an assessment of the development economics of the donor project. The CAC policy was, re was revised in uh, January of 2020 to say that the CACs determined through, ne through negotiations will target, will target a minimum of 75% of the increase in land value based upon the rezoning application. We don't have a problem with that. And then the CAC implementation procedures say that the increase in land value is determined by calculating a rezoned value of the land and deducting the value of the land under existing zoning. We don't really have a problem with that either. But we do have a problem with the way real estate department is interpreting the value of the land under existing zoning. So real estate's method of determining value of land under existing zoning disregards the market value of the land. Instead, real estate determines the value of our property as if the Mount Pleasant Community Plan, which was approved more than 10 years ago, never existed, as if the only way to develop the property is under the specific restrictions of the existing zoning, again, ignore, ignoring the directions and the policies set out in the community plan, by ignoring all comparable sale transactions in the immediate vicinity of our property under the same zoning, by ignoring the specific site attributes such as location and visibility, and by ignoring BC assessments value of the property, which the city relies upon in order to collect property taxes. By ignoring all of the above, real estate decided that the project can afford to pay a CAC of $4.4 million, which is almost $35,000 a unit. 
However, if you take into account the actual market value of the property, which we had to pay to acquire it, the project barely turns a profit. The only way to justify these rental projects is by holding the building for a minimum period of 10 years. Once the mortgage, once the mortgage has been paid down and after refinancing, the cash flow from operations finally starts to make sense. How does, he, how does real estate actually get to the CAC determination? First, we showed you in the previous slide that they minimize the value of the land under existing zoning by ignoring market value and coming up with a fictitious value. It is fictitious because you can't actually go out and buy land for that price. Next, they inflate the rezoned value of the land by manipulating costs and revenues. If you minimize costs by choosing to exclude some costs, such as financing costs, and maximizing revenue by relying on top of market market cap rates, you can maximize potential profits and in turn, maximize res residual land value, which real estate then determines is the rezoned value of the land, which is obviously inflated. By creating this artificial land lift, they can now argue for a CAC contribution. But if they were to use the market value of the land, say as determined by an impartial third party, such as BC assessment, and if they relied on market average cap rates, real estate would be hard pressed to conclude that a CAC would be afforded by the project. We as developers don't have the luxury of working in a pretend world where the market factors and influences do not exist. In the real world, we have to pay market price for the land and if the land is located at the prime intersection of Main and Second, the gateway to Mount Pleasant, we may even have to pay a premium. The fact is that if you use real world land values, real world costs and real world revenues, the proposed project fails to meet normal performance metrics for development feasibility. The conflict lies in the interpretation of the council approved CAC policy, which targets a minimum, minimum of 75% of the increase in land value resulting from a rezoning application. The CAC implementation policy, which is not council approved, distinguishes between the rezoned value of the land and the value of the land under existing zoning. It does not say that we should ignore the market value of the land under existing zoning. If we insist on ignoring the market value of the land, it will be impossible to make rental projects feasible without a massive density bonus. Like in the West End, for example, where we increase density from 2.2 FSR to 7 FSR for secure rental housing. In our case, we're not asking for any extra density beyond what the Mount Pleasant Community Plan already permits for strata condominium development. In a nutshell, the project simply cannot afford a CAC contribution based upon the economics of the project. Full stop. We have shared these numbers with the real estate department. The real estate department's interpretation and application of the CAC implementation procedures is stifling rental housing construction. On the one hand, we want to incentivize rental, incentivize rental housing construction through the Vancouver housing strategy. And then the CAC policy in the way real estate chooses to interpret it undermines the housing policies and claws back all the incentives by imposing a cash CAC contribution. So we have two recommendations. First, please refer our application to a public hearing and allow us to have a fulsome discussion. Next, and in general, consider exempting rental housing applications altogether from the CAC policy and, impl and implementation procedures. This will dramatically accelerate the processing and delivery of secured market rental buildings. To be clear, except where big density increases are awarded through rezoning, there is no win windfall that benefits the developer in these circumstances. The big beneficiaries are rental tenants who are going to benefit from an increased inventory of rental housing options and from the relief the new options provide for, re for relieving demand pressure on more affordable rental housing options currently existing in the marketplace. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation, um, Council. So now we're going to move to questions for staff or the applicant. Maybe just let us know 
at the beginning uh, who you'd like to answer your question. And also, if, if um, try not to talk about the, the uh, kind of structural merits of the project or um, things that we'd normally talk about at public hearing, we really only need to do that if we refer this to public hearing. So really, we're, we're uh, you know, perhaps limit yourself to the uh, information that the applicant has brought to your attention or staff have brought to your attention. And I'll, uh, I'll just jump in if I think it's going a little too far over, although I'm just guessing at this too. So uh, we'll do our best together. Thank you, uh, Councillor Dejanova, up to five minutes. Thanks, um, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Stewart, I wanted to ask a question of our staff and that's in uh, regards to the CAC policy that I understand uh, was expressed um, in Teresa O'Donnell's presentation is not being met and that's the reason that staff is is suggesting that this not be referred. Um, I'm just wondering what kind of inequity this would create between other uh, projects that although they may have met the Mount Pleasant plan did also meet the CAC policy. So what kind of inequities would that cause among separate projects? Just um, just thinking about your question, Councilor Dejanova. Because it was in the presentation, let, let, I let feel that finish. I should be able let, to let ask. Me just, let me just finish. I, I just think we, we do have to be careful about talking about other projects, uh, too specifically, just because we're thinking about this particular project. So I'll just provide that direction to staff before they answer. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Thank you, Councillor, for the question. That's a good question. Uh, it is unusual for staff to recommend uh, the council refuse a public hearing, and this is the first time we've done that. That refusal was based solely on the, the application's uh, failure to comply with CAC. The other projects uh, that we've, typically we find, um, typically we do require compliance with the CAC to move forward. Thank you, and and uh, because you spoke about the broader policy, um, our other and and it is in the context of this policy, and it it being said by staff, and I want to be very clear, the mayor, this was a part of the presentation, so this information sure. I need to have this. Yep. So it was said that this is a policy. Um, there's one policy that's being met, another policy that's not being met. Is there has staff recommended? in the past that others not meeting this policy in this specific district schedule move forward and are referred? Thank you for the question. The uh, policy? That's correct. Staff has, we have not had a project that didn't meet policy okay. today so I, that I'm, I'm aware of. Thank you. Uh, those are my questions for now. Mayor, I'm prepared to move our recommendation, one of the recommendations, and uh, would it be best that I go back on the queue to do that? Well, we'll just, um, I'm just on the questions queue now, so we'll just okay. see how it plays out. I, I, I don't really promise, you know, that to, to reserve spots for people moving things, but uh, I'm gonna move on to Councillor Kirby Young now for up to five minutes. Yeah, thanks. I have two questions, one for the applicant, so I'll start with that first. Um, and thank you for the, the perspective. Um, I just want to follow up on one comment that you made. Um, and you were commenting that it didn't make sense because you would have to hold on to the building, i.e. I think you said for up to 10 years. So just to clarify, are you saying that you are um, disagreeing or frustrated because you couldn't sell the building in a short period of time after it was completed? Uh, no, not at all. Actually, we as a company are uh, are big landlords in this marketplace, so we hold our buildings. We have no intention of selling. Um, our, my point is that if th these buildings don't create a windfall, so they're, they're, the, the, the reality is if you use the real cost that we incur to build them, that, that there is no CAC. The only way the CAC was justified was by comparing our property to other similarly zoned, not the same zoning, actually just sort of similar zoning in the Clark Drive corridor. Okay, which, I'm going to leave all, there just for time because I have limited time, but I just, I appreciate that. I just want a clarification that that one question. Thank you. Um, I have another question for staff um, with the time I have, and it's just with respect to clarification on 
the policy piece is falling under the Mount Pleasant plan. Um, and we heard commentary that um, this isn't different than what the plan permits, but I wonder if staff can clarify that point because I see on page six of the referral report, it says that the plan allows for maximum FSR of five and for strata type of residential development, but we're considering obviously a rental proposal here. So can you comment on how that does or does not meet the policy with respect to, I think the comment was that there's no additional density being requested beyond what the plan permitted. Hi, Councillor uh, Councillor uh, Kirby Young. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. Um, the 5.02 FSR is generally in alignment with the FSR set out in the plan. We do, uh, on occasion, allow for increased density for the provision of rental housing, which is the case here. Um, just another note. Um, yeah, the the residential tenure, um, the plan doesn't actually um, set very strict boundaries against what that could be. We did at the time anticipate strata residential. Things have shifted. We do allow for um, uh, market rental at this location. The other thing I just wanted to point out was um, the plan and the public benefit strategy does specifically identify that these sites are expected to deliver not only housing, but affordable housing. So that's a number one priority. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll leave it there for now. Okay, thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. We're on to Councillor Dominato of the five. Uh, thanks, Mayor. I have a question for the applicant and it's just to, um, I appreciate your frustrations, but my question is specifically around um, the, um, not the CACs, but the um, DCL waiver, which I appreciate um, you can seek that that waiver, but would you consider foregoing the DCL waiver is my question. Yeah, the, the DCL waiver definitely helps in us um, delivering affordability. Now, if we did not take the DCL waiver, we would just, you know, we would be free to set whatever, you know, uh, rents that the market can, can bear. And our, but our preference is to deliver affordability. That's what we want to do. If the, if, you know, if we were directed to not take the waiver and then we would accept that as well. Um, but I, I think we would like to deliver affordability. That's our goal. Okay. Thank you. That was all. Thanks. I, I do have two counselors on the queue. Councillor Dejanova, you do have a few minutes left for questions. I'm I'm prepared to move uh, the staff's recommendations, recommendations A. You, you can do that, uh, I'd but, like to do that. but yeah. Councillor Kirby Young is on the queue uh, for questions still, just so you know. I understand Councillor Kirby Young has asked questions, so I'm prepared to move the recommendation. Okay. Uh, do we have a seconder then? Councillor Boyle. Thank you, Councillor Boyle. Okay, so we're on the main queue. Councillor Dejanova, you have up to five minutes. Uh, um, Mayor, I was on for a point of procedure. Just noting oh, no, you, you can speak for, for that verbally. Go ahead. Um, I was just wondering if I could make a motion if Council wanted to consider extending past five to complete the business because I know we're going to be we're hitting that ten minute mark shortly. Yeah, can I come back to you? Uh, and we'll I'll come back to you in about in about ten minutes um, and see if we finish this item. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Dejanova. Up to five for debate Thank, decision. Thanks very much, and and I do want to say that I really appreciate the applicant's uh, presentation and and walking us through this, and and it's not an easy decision in the sense of the fact is a lot of that does resonate with me and understanding that you know the cost of CACs, although they they are a public benefit, uh, they do often add to the cost of housing. Also understanding that. Um, DCL waivers do provide affordability and I think that, you know, actions speak louder than words and I certainly have supported that um, with my voting record um, in making sure that, uh, you know, those opportunities are available to deepen affordability. That being said, um, in looking at policy and policy is very specific in, in that, you know, something may meet one policy but not another policy and looking at fairness overall. And I'm trying to be careful, Mayor Stewart, you know, and, and heed your comments. Um, but I also did hear uh, 
our director of planning development and sustainability um, note that specifically other projects had met those policies and they had not referred a project to move forward that had not met both the CAC policy and the Mount Pleasant plan. So for, for those reasons and, and you know, considering the answers to, to my questions, um, I'm prepared to support staff's recommendations. I do hope that there will be, you know, some work that the developer can do with staff and find a way to move forward with this. Um, that being said, you know, when I look at sort of the public amenities, uh, that especially families, and when we look at like families and housing, um, overall, a lot of people are relying on public amenities because they don't have the traditional single family detached home any longer. Um, they may not have their own yard and we look at amenities in lots of different ways. I'm not saying that there isn't a public benefit to what the applicant in this case is trying to do, uh, but if staff don't feel that that meets the policy right now, um, I'm prepared to support staff on the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Kirby Young, up to uh, five. No, I was going to make a motion to extend, but I understand one councilor has a child care pickup, so I won't make that motion. Thanks. Okay, we're almost there. Uh, councilor Hardwick, up to five for debate. Great, thank you. Well, paradoxically, I will support the staff recommendations. Um, that said, I question the veracity of the underlying policies, uh, uh, including the Housing Vancouver strategy and the pay for growth policy. Overall, this paradigm has inflated land values throughout the city through upward rezoning, and this paradigm needs to be reconsidered as ultimately it's an unsustainable model. So weighing this all in the balance, it's preferable to support staff's recommendation at this time, but I do emphasize that this entire policy area needs a rethink. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Uh, Councillor Weeb, up to five. Yeah, my question is proponent. Um, you made a comment stating Sorry, that we're, we're not we're not on questions anymore. That uh, we're on debate. Okay, I will be supporting staff. One of the comments was made that um, this is like the Mount Pleasant plan didn't exist. Um, the Mount Pleasant plan. I sat on that implementation committee. The goal was not to raise property values significantly, recognizing that that lift could be utilized to build amenities in the neighborhood and ensure that we created a complete community. Um, and I think that staff are supporting that and I will be supporting staff. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I'm just trying to get this uh, pulled up on screen so people see what we're voting for. Um, clerks, any luck yet uh, pulling that up on the public screen? There we go. So that um, council, just so uh, the public knows as well, that's uh, what we'll be voting on here. I uh, don't see anybody else in the queue for debate. So um, I'll move to the vote. Councillor Dominato. Just remind council that if you're in, yeah, you know, just to take a close look at the the screen. Councillor Dominato, I need you to uh, cast your vote. Oh, that's, I see a yellow triangle by Councillor Dominato's name. Thanks. Okay, Council, we're just have eight minutes here, so we might just hang on until hopefully Councillor Dominato comes back online. But as per our other oh, area here that see the yellow square gone, Councillor Dominato, do you need a vote assist? Sorry, my computer crashed. It, are we voting on uh, recommendation A that was moved by Councillor DiGenova, the staff That's right. recommendation? That's right. To support the staff, it's a yes to, uh, to uh, move forward to the public hearing. It would be in opposition. Uh, so I'm in favor of the staff recommendation. Okay, Thanks. Thanks. We'll mark you as that. Thank you. And um, okay, council, that has uh, passed unanimously. So uh, this uh, this will not go to public hearing and uh, staff can work with the applicant to see what else they can come up with. Okay, thank you so much, uh, everybody for that. We are at uh, 453 council. 
Uh, we have a whack of bylaws to get through next, so I suggest we just break now for dinner and come back at uh, 6 p.m. So uh, thanks, everybody, and we'll see you back at 6.
We have 48 bylaws on the agenda. I'm going to have to uh, just ask you to confirm uh, that you have reviewed the proceedings of the meetings if you want to vote, and I'll go through those individually before we call for the larger vote. Uh, count, let's see, uh, bylaw 27 is from the public hearing of July 9th and 11th. Uh, Councillor Fry, you are absent for this item. Have you reviewed the proceedings and will you be voting? Oh, sorry, I have not and I will not. Okay, uh, clerks are just gonna take a like a running kind of count of these and then that it'll be reflected in the votes. Uh, bylaw 32 is from the public hearing on June 5th. Uh, at previous calendar meetings, many councillors noticed they had reviewed the proceedings and were therefore eligible to vote. Councillors Dominato, Kirby Young, and Swanson, Swanson still need to review to be eligible to vote. So, Councillor Dominato, have you reviewed and will you be voting? No, I have not and will okay. not. Councillor Kirby Young? Please repeat the bylaw number, Mayor. It is bylaw 32 from the public hearing of June 5th. I have not. I will not. Okay, thanks. Uh, Councillor Swanson. No, and no. Okay, thanks. Anybody wish to hold any of these yeah. bylaws for debate or separate vote? Councillor Swanson. This is loading interface. Okay. Uh, Council so I'm just uh, seeing a number of hands up. Uh, Councillor Hardwick, then Councillor Weave. Councillor Hardwick. Thank you. Yes, please. I would like to hold number 43 and 48 for separate vote, please. 43 and 48. Okay, uh, Councillor Weeb. You're on mute, I think. Uh, I'll be holding 8 and 16 and I'll have to declare due to abundance of caution due to my interest in both these um improvement areas and from legal staff i will be stepping away from 8 and 16 and i will be voting um against 39 so i'd like 39 removed as well the tree protection bylaw okay councillor swanson Councillor Swanson, we heard you there. Oh, sorry. That's can okay. You, can you hear me now? I can hear you. I just can can't see. 47. You. 47. Okay. So let's see. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six were held. So I think let's just go through them um, one at a time. Uh, so we'll, uh, I'll need somebody to move uh, bylaw number. So move Councillor DiGenova. 43, bylaw 43 moved and seconded. Second, Councillor Carr. Great. Any debate on 43 held by uh, Councillor Hardwick? I'm just, uh, you'll need to put yourself on the queue now if you want to debate these. I don't see anybody on the queue, so I'm going to call a vote. Are we voting on screen, Mayor Stewart? If so, I'll need a vote assist. Is Councillor DiGenova point of privilege in favor? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Councillor. And I, I didn't vote, and it attributed me incorrectly. Well, no, it's still we're voting still underway. Mayor, there's no mayor. Point of mayor, it's the it's the clerk. I think the vote uh, ended by accident. Uh, I would recommend you reset, please. Okay, please. Let's do that then. Okay. So we're voting again on that one, number 43. Councillor DeGenova, did you need to vote? Yes, thank you, Mayor. I didn't want to have to ask again in favor, please, for me. Right. Thank you. Okay, thanks. That has passed with Councillor Hardwick in opposition. Uh, we're going to move to uh, number 48. And I need somebody to move uh, bylaw number 48. So moved, Councillor DeGenova. Do we have a seconder? Second, Councillor Carr. Okay, if there's any debate, I've got the queue open. I don't see anybody on the queue, so we'll call a vote. Uh, Councillor DeGenova, do you need a vote assist? <coughs> well, point of privilege, Mayor Stewart, a vote uh, assist in favor. Sorry, I okay, was thank muted. You. Thank no you. problem. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Kirby Young, too. We need you to vote on this one. 
Sorry, my mouse. Okay, there it is. Thanks. Okay, thank you. That has passed with Councillor Hardwick in opposition. Okay, Councillor, we we don't have to hold eighteen and eight and sixteen. Uh, the clerks have noticed uh, you wouldn't be voting on those due to the conflict, but thirty nine you've asked uh, to hold. So I'll ask somebody to move uh, bylaw number thirty nine. So moved. So moved, Councillor Dijanova. Councillor uh, Dominato moved, seconded by Councillor Dejanova. And any debate on this one, please put yourself on the queue. I don't, oh, Councillor Weave, go ahead. Yeah, I'll be voting against this, recognizing that we are in a biodiversity emergency um, and the importance of trees to reducing GHGs. And I think it's important that we look at what options are available, including the tree bank in the future um, to protect our canopy here in Vancouver. Thank you. I don't see anybody else on the queue, so we'll call a vote on that one. Point of privilege, Councillor yeah. DiGenova, on the vote assist in favor, please. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that has passed with Councillor Weeb, Hardwick, and Fry in opposition. Uh, and the last one uh, is number 47. Rats, I didn't write down who held that one. Thank you, Councilor Dijanova. Great. Councilor Swanson. It was Councilor yeah. Swanson, Mayor. Great. Okay. Thanks very much. So we'll, uh, Councilor Dijanova moved it. Do we have a seconder? Second, Councilor Carr. Okay. So I've got the queue open. If anybody wants to speak to this one, I don't see anybody on the queue. So we'll move to the vote. Privilege, Councillor Dijanova, please uh, record me as in favor, Mayor Stewart. Yep, thank you. It's recorded. And that is passed with Councillor Swanson and Hardwick in opposition. And now I'll need uh, someone to move that. Um, uh, so move, uh, Councillor Dijanova. The remaining bylaws. Yes, okay, thank Councillor Carr. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Thank you very much. I'll check if there's any discussion on these. I don't see anybody on the queue. So uh, we can just do a uh, oral vote. All in favor say yay. 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 Opposed say nay. Yay. I take that as a yay. Uh, so the motion carries. Thank you very much. And the list of bylaws can be found on the city's website. Okay, council, we're moving on to administrative motions. There's only one. This is the resolution. Uh, it's a closure and sale of a portion of road adjacent to 2929 uh, West 29th Avenue. And uh, does anybody wish to declare a conflict on this item? If so, let me know. And I'll ask council if you have questions for staff. These are the times to ask on this item. I don't see anybody on the queue. Someone would like to move the motion, please. So moved. Councilor Kirby. Councilor Kirby. Councilor Kirby Councilor Councilor Dejanova. Dejanova. Thank you by Councilor Dejanova. I have the queue open if people would like to debate this. I don't see anybody on the queue. So we'll, uh, we can just do an oral vote on this one. All in favor say yay. 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 Opposed say nay. Thank you. That's passed. Okay. So now we're on the notices of council members' motions for the upcoming meetings. And I'll just give folks a chance to populate the queue. Uh, please, uh, reminder to please state the title of the motion and the date of the council meeting on what you intend to move the motion and then send them in. So we have uh, Councillor Kirby Young, go ahead. Yeah, thanks Mayor. Uh, this might sound familiar, um, but submitted by myself and jointly with Councillor Boyle for the January 18th, 2022nd or first council meeting of 2022, mm -hmm. motion titled towards a quieter and emission-free landscape maintenance and the future in Vancouver. Okay, thank you. And th sorry, did you say the, uh, the date is for the next council meeting? I said it was for January 18th, 2022 for the first council meeting of that year. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, Councillor Bly. Thanks, Mayor. I have one um, motion on notice and that is um, a response strategy for vulnerable populations during extreme hot weather conditions. Okay, uh, thank you. Councillor Swanson. I have one for July 6th called Keeping the Public in the Information Loop. Okay, and you're going to be moving it for which meeting? 
July 6th. July 6th. Okay. Uh, Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Mayor. I'm calling notice on a motion prioritizing the night economy as part of the city's restart strategy for July 6th. Okay. Thank you. One second, please. We're over to Councillor Weeb next. I have a motion on notice called Keys to Housing Affordability for July 6, 2021. Okay. Thank you. Uh, right. I've got one. Just bear with me while I find the title here. Uh, let's see. Just trying to find the title. One second, Council. Okay, thanks. Uh, it is toward reconciliation colon renaming Trutch Street, and that is for the next uh, council meeting. Okay, thanks, Council. That's uh, that's it for uh, notice of members' motion. Uh, we have. Point and privilege, Mayor Stewart. Yes, go ahead. It's Councilor Dijanovic. Um, I'm just trying to log on right now to WebEx. If you could have me the queue for inquiry, thank you. Yeah, I will. We've got uh, new business first, and we uh, have two items for new business uh, at least. So the first one is a uh, request for leaves of absence uh, for myself for civic business for meetings on Wednesday, June 23rd from 3 to 10, and Councillor Carr for civic business for meetings on Thursday, June 24th from 3 to 4. Someone like to move this motion? Move, Thank you. Seconder? Second, Councillor Bly. Thanks very much. All in favor, yay. 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 Okay. okay. Point of personal privilege, Mayor. Just going to finish this. Nay? Mm -hmm. Unless you can't say nay, are you stopped from voting? <laughs> no? Uh, if we if you don't have any nays, then that's passed, uh, Councillor Hardwick, unless it was related to that vote. It was related to another LOA. Sure, I mean, you have, you can move that now if you like, I think, am I right? No, Claire? It was actually moved in my case on April 16th. Uh, the LOA was was um, requested for civic for a Metro committee actually a long time ago, but I, uh, I have record of it here having been requested on April 16th and I just wanted to be confirming that I will be uh, away from 1 to 5 tomorrow. May have been because of the changes in the clerk. Okay. Um, just gonna check with the clerk on that one. Clerks, do we have any information on that? Just one moment, Mayor. Thanks. Mayor, we have Councillor Hardwick as a LOA for one from one till five tomorrow, along with Councillor Swanson, Councillor. Kirby Young and yourself for for other times as well. Okay, that's uh, is that to answer the question, Councillor Hardwick? Yes, I just wanted to confirm. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks so much. So I have a piece of new business, uh, and I'll have to um, uh, cede the floor to uh, Deputy. I have my WebEx up now. Thank okay. you. Okay. So so are you prepared to take the? Please the... take over. Sure? Okay. Yes, I am. Thanks so much. So I have a, a new business to introduce, uh, Chair Dejanova. Okay. Go and ahead, it's been please, Mayor to Council. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so this is a uh, motion that I'm hoping people won't call um, notice on. <clears throat> do with uh, the state of emergency we've declared on uh, COVID-19, and we've uh, between us and the province, we're trying to sort out uh, just how we roll these off. Uh, what we don't want to do is uh, roll off our state of emergency uh, and cause some kind of a confusion within the public. Uh, say we rolled off ours before the province was rolled off theirs. Uh, it may get misreported and people might uh, stop doing what they're doing. So this motion is merely to um, instruct the director of legal services to uh, bring forward enactment for uh, to repeal the state of emergency bylaw uh, 12661. 
uh, at the first regular council meeting that comes after the provincial state of emergency has been lifted. So again, this is a technical thing, but uh, just bringing it forward to ensure that we don't uh, cause any confusion uh, in terms of the uh, physical distancing and other orders brought in by the province. So Second. Thanks, Thanks, Mayor Stewart. I, I see others on the queue, so uh, I'll ask the, the clerk to advance Councillor Fry. Is it for this item, Councillor Fry? Uh, no, Chair. It's actually for uh, uh, my own new business. Okay, and Councillor Councillor Di Genova, this is the clerk. I will move to the main queue so that councillors may uh, enter the Thank queue. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Councillor Kirbyo. Um, no, not for this item. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Seeing no one on the queue and hearing Councillor Carr seconding the item, please proceed, uh, Mayor Stewart. And I appreciate it that the clerk will move us the main queue. Thank you. Yeah, we are on the main queue now. Uh, I don't really have anything else to add. Just again, it's more of an administrative thing to uh, make sure we don't confuse the public. Okay, uh, seeing see no one else on the queue, uh, I I will, uh, I'll just wait. I like to count to three in case anyone's trying to get on the queue. One, two, three. Uh, and I think we can call a vote on this. Council, please vote on screen. And I will ask the clerk to read the vote results. The vote is complete, Chair, with no one in opposition. Thanks very much. Over to you, Mayor Stewart. Thanks very much, Councillor Dijanova. Uh, right. So I've got. So if you want to put yourself on the queue, if there's any other new business, I've got Councillor Fry. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Um, so I also have a. Uh, 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 a, a motion that I'm hoping nobody will call notice on. Um, this is um, <clears throat> a, a, a UBCM motion that we'd like to get in before June the 30th, which is the deadline. And it's regarding the BC Utilities, uh, BC Utilities Commission regulation of municipal energy systems. And this came to us from our staff. Uh, the gist of it is in August of 2019, um, the BCUC uh, introduced uh, and established an inquiry to look at um, energy uh, utilities affiliated with municipalities and regional districts. Uh, and the intent of this motion is to really sort of insulate us in, in the event that the BCUC decides to take an oversight role uh, that that uh, as, as a result of this in inquiry, that we still retain um, sort of municipal control over our energy systems so that we can really take a more progressive and comprehensive look at some of the priorities that drive municipal energy utilities now, which is obviously climate change and, and, and local governance. Uh, as Second, Councillor DiGenova. <laughs> All right, well, yeah, I don't have to keep talking then. Thank you, Councillor well, DiGenova. <laughs> great, thanks. And I'll pull up the main queue now if anybody would like to speak to this. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young, go ahead, up to five minutes. Yeah, I have a couple of clarification questions if I could ask for you to the mover. Sure, point of information, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, first one, Councillor Fry, you said it came through staff. How did, can you just, how did that come through staff? I don't recall. Uh, the, the, the mayor's office had reached out and asked for advice on how to um, best uh, frame the language around getting this into UBCM in such a short timeline. Okay, so it came to the mayor's office, it didn't come from city staff then? You said city staff, I just want to, I'm trying to clarify, I understand. The Apparently through city staff by way of the mayor's office. So did it come from the utility staff then? I, uh... You know, I, I didn't think to ask. Okay. Um, okay, a follow up on that one. Um, in terms of the energy utility piece, because we are governed by, I'm not just asking questions, I'm not intending to call notice, but I just want to make sure I'm grounded in this before voting. So it's a specific question. Um, we're governed by the Vancouver Charter, but Vancouver obviously uniquely operates our own uh, energy utility. So are we not protected through the Charter or no? Because that's its, that operation sits outside of that and was not anticipated in the charter well i think that's that's the concern and, and i should add that this is also an issue for other local governments like I, I believe nelson has their own utility i think new westminster may have their own energy utility um so obviously with the, they have the community charter we have the vancouver charter that governs us but the bcuc uh would this this is more of an insulation or a, an insurance i should say 
in the event that the BCUC wants complete oversight. So they haven't made those recommendations yet, so we're sort of anticipating that. Okay, and then third and final question, and thanks for indulging me, um, that it says sort of to redesign the regulatory regime to maintain or expand. So are we fearful that powers will be taken away or is this just really about modernization? Uh, I think it's it's both. So this is based on conversations that our intergovernmental team have had with other local governments and concerns that, that not just the city of Vancouver has. So we're sort of trying to be anticipatory in the event that something comes forward. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. All right, Councilor Nova, up to five minutes on this one. <clears throat> Thanks very much. I also have a point of poll for Councilor Fry. Sure. If you'll indulge me, Mayor. Sure. Uh, Councilor Fry, are you thinking about the ultimate ramifications that this could literally have on ratepayers and people who are trying to be more green in uh, their energy usage, such as some of the UC, or, or I suppose, the the BC Utilities Commission's uh, decisions in the past, uh, such as their uh, decisions uh, regarding creative energy? Uh, this, uh, certainly there would be concerns. This is, is more about municipal, so I, 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 I appreciate no, I that understand, creative but, energy would but fall the, under that. BCUC has, has said before that if they feel that there's a monopoly, that they will not allow it to move forward, and that has had consequences and has perhaps affected decisions in the past. Is is that something that you're looking to address here? Um, you know, I think I think what BCUC reeled on creative energy was around a monopoly on a specific um, district energy system. So uh, that does not concern me because we're not talking about the entire city of Vancouver. It's no, but, a but BCUC energy system within. had had decision making power then, and as you said, this motion would ultimately give municipalities more power. So is that what you're intending to do? So that if the municipality wanted to move forward with something like that, we would be able to? I, th I think it's about getting more local choice and redesigning the regulatory regime so that, that local governments have, have a little bit more say and that this isn't decided by a BCUC in, 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 okay. in its entirety. So for example, if the same thing were to happen again, it would be about local choice and municipalities instead of BCUC's decision. Correct. Is that correct? I think BCUC would, would, would still okay. be allowed to have a, a say, but they wouldn't have the say. Thanks very much. I wholeheartedly support this. I think that really the unintended consequences when we look at ratepayers and using the carrot, not so much the stick, uh, to move things forward here uh, is really important when we consider balancing affordability and climate action, which is something that I've said from the beginning that I feel we have to do to be able to allow people to live in the city of Vancouver. I want to give them the spending power and the dollars back to be able to invest in green energy. So um, I do support this, Councillor Fry, and thanks for bringing it forward. Thank you. That's it for questions or uh, comments, so I can move us to a vote on this one. Councillor Weep, just need your vote. Thank you, uh, that's unanimous. Thank you so much, uh, Councillor Try. Uh, we're still on new business. Does anybody have, uh, I'm gonna clear the this queue. Sorry, I'm just gonna move us back to the question queue. So if folks have new business, uh, please put yourself on the queue. Councillor Kirby Young, you have new business? Oh no, I thought you were moving to the next queue. I'm on fire. I just, I just wanna finish off new business and then I'm gonna move on to inquiries and other matters so I can do that now. Uh, I'll move to inquiries and other matters. So Councillor Kirby Young, you're on the queue for that one. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a couple that relate to the um, to the extreme heat and I used to ask this question, one second. Okay. Sorry, I canceled the vacuum in the background. <laughs> um, I have um, I have uh, two questions. I used to ask this one at Port Board and that was, it was always helpful because we received questions. If um, the city manager could advise that plans and sort of the normal um, policy that we have in place to activate cooling centers just in the hot, extreme heat in summertime, just as we do in the winter time. That's my first question. Okay, city manager. So thanks, um, 
Council, for the question. So the city does have an extreme heat uh, plan, um, and it's activated based on uh, certain triggers that are defined by uh, Environment Canada heat warnings. Um, and within that, um, we then have uh, a series of actions that we take. There are there are two thresholds, um, and uh, cooling centers is one of those um, measures that we adopt, uh, and we do communicate those details out. Um, in the case of more severe heat conditions, we actually expand the hours that those are available. So that's one of the measures that um, we would implement in response to extreme heat. Okay, and so can we expect activations this coming weekend as we're looking at 30 degree plus temperatures or what's the activation trigger? Maybe just so that people are aware. Yeah, right now the um, the current forecast does not meet our trigger. We're of course watching this very closely um, and we'll um, adjust. We have implemented though uh, cooling centers that those will be in effect uh, this coming weekend. Um, I, I think the, the forecasts are quite localized uh, that we use. So Environment Canada, it really is city of Vancouver as opposed to the Fraser Valley or, or um, you know, uh, communities that are inland from us. Uh, and generally the temperatures in city of Vancouver are um, materially lower, but our, our staff monitor this kind of on an ongoing basis and our team's ready to adjust um, as need be based on, on those uh, updated forecasts. Okay, and a couple follow-ups. One question that I get asked is that was always incredibly popular was the pop-up tray parks with um, the FRS, the Vancouver Fire, still plans to do those again because it augments the number of tray park infrastructure that we have across the city and city parks. Yeah, those those are one of the measures that we, we uh, implement when we get to an extreme heat alert as declared by Vancouver Coastal Health. So that's kind of at the level two um, response. Okay, but still in the toolkit as a... Absolutely, yeah. Office. Okay, um, and then my other question, um, also related to heat, but slightly different topic, is just whether or not um, we're monitoring or looking at, given that we're still in, you know, people have a long way to go before getting their second vaccine, and people are still outside, um, and the additional visitation on parks, which is significant, um, especially in key areas. Are we looking at additional um, garbage and recycling pickup in those areas? Because I know if you hit Spanish banks or kits or whatever on the weekend, it is packed. And there's a lot of uh, rubbish that's building out, which isn't great from a health perspective either. So our team, I, we do have, um, I, I believe an update coming to council um, in writing on this. I can I can take that back and follow up with more detail, councillor, but uh, certainly we're, we're uh, alive to the issues um, in parks, um, the demand on the park space and the associated um, garbage that comes with that. So we do, we definitely scale up our resources in the summertime um, and have based on council's um, additional investments in street cleaning this year have kind of expanded generally in public realm cleaning, but I can follow up with more details specifically on uh, parks. Okay, that would be super. Thanks city manager, appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Swanson. Yeah, so this afternoon, all of us on council got an email from 26 groups and two individuals including most of the groups named in the decriminalizing poverty motion. And it was about um, that, that motion was about replacing police with community led services. And this letter that we got says, quote, at this time, we are making the difficult decision to cease any involvement with the process. We have outlined our concerns here to the city staff and reps of reciprocal consulting in order to move forward to defunding police while supporting community led initiatives, police and or police adjacent organizations can't be at the table. Point of order. So my question is, can the manager say for the public's information, how does the city plan to respond to this letter and the concerns of the 26 groups? Thank you. Thank you, point just before order. you respond, uh, city manager, we have a point of order, uh, Councillor Dejanova. I, I don't know if it's a point of order or a point of procedure, well, but I think conflict know. out of that motion, Mayor right. Stewart, yeah. so I Councilor need to conflict Dave, out not Councilor having Dave. that information. Okay, so that's not that's, that's not what a point. I'm trying to know. Thank you. Yes, but you shouldn't interrupt folks if it isn't a point of order. Uh, that's that's in the bylaws, so I shouldn't uh, be here if it's a conflict either. That's right, but you have to let the, the council. No warning. It. You're Thank interrupting you. me now, and I would just say that. You wait till the end of the statement. You're not in conflict to hear a statement. If you think you're in a conflict to hear the the response, then you're you're welcome to exit the meeting. Thank but you. 
Uh, so if I could be put placed in the waiting room, I suppose, or if the clerk has any suggestion as to how I should do that, because I can leave, but I need to come back because I'm next on the queue. City Manager. Thanks, Mayor Stewart, and thanks, Councillor, for the question. So, yeah, I have uh, received and, and reviewed the letter that you speak of, uh, you, you mentioned there. I um, the, the groups, uh, a number of the groups um, that uh, had signed on had also communicated separately with staff in arts, culture, and community services, conveyed the concerns that they've articulated there. So at this point in time, uh, staff don't believe that the approach that we had recommended to council um, and that council had endorsed uh, to uh, proceed with this piece of work, we, we don't believe that approach is feasible um, given the significant concerns that we expressed here and, and the indication that we've received that these groups, many of whom were named in council's motion, have indicated they're not prepared to participate. So at this point in time, we are reviewing that um, and considering what alternatives we might be able to suggest to council um, and would be engaging as part of that with those groups um, that have signed on to that letter. So at this point, I don't have a specific um, recommendation for you, councillor, but we, we we are recommending, we're not proposing as staff to continue with that approach at this point. We don't believe it would be constructive or feasible. We don't believe it will produce the outcomes that we had expected in terms of being able to come back to council with recommendations. So. We're regrouping on that uh, and we'll provide um, council with further updates um, as we're able. Okay, thanks. Is that it, Councillor uh, Swanson? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, clerks, if you can inform Councillor Dejanova, she can come back into the room. I'll move on to, uh, to her. And if she's not in the room, I'll just go ahead with Councillor Fry and put Councillor Dejanova back on the list. I'm here. Okay, I'm go here, ahead. Mayor Stewart. Yep, Thank go you. ahead. Uh, my my inquiry is regarding the motion moved by Mayor Stewart about the gender audit is what I'm going to call it. And I haven't received a request to have an interview or have any input on that. And I'm just wondering, you know, as we continue on with these 16 to 18 hour days at council and thinking about people who may be wanting to run or considering running um, or dissuaded from running and looking at uh, increasing participation, especially of people who are female uh, in in politics and in local government. I'm just wondering when that will be complete and when uh, councillors, I'm, I'm, assume, I'm assuming it's all councillors, but maybe it's just myself who hasn't received a request to be interviewed for this, will we'll receive this request. Thanks, uh, city manager, maybe office. that's the like, clerks, is it? Yeah. I, I, I sure. wasn't directly to towards you there, Stuart, because it was a motion that passed and went to staff. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I, I think it went to the Sharing that, yes. I think it did go to the clerks, so. though. Yeah. Wherever you'd we, like we to can, address the question. Thank you. Yeah, I can follow up with the, to council with an update on the status of that work. Thank you. Anything else, Councilor Dijanova? That's all for now. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Councilor Fry. Yeah, this is uh, more of an other other kind of announcement. Um, just to let everyone know that uh, the National Zero Waste Council, uh, of which I am uh, a city appointee uh, and sit as chair of the Product Design and Packaging Committee, uh, on Thursday at 10 a.m., we will be hosting and I'll be moderating a webinar uh, looking at uh, recovering the momentum of reusables in retail. As this council will know, uh, we certainly saw uh, an increase in single use items uh, as a result of COVID and, uh, and that has impacted uh, uh, the, the direction to reduce single use by bringing in re reusables. Uh, what we did through the committee is we've engaged with the Toronto School of Public Health, the Dalalana, <laughs> and uh, representatives from the retail community, including uh, representatives from Heinz uh, Craft, uh, Nature's Path, and sorry, and sorry, and London Drugs, and uh, together we'll be talking about how we can reintroduce reusables and really look at the science around COVID transmission on these reusables. So think shopping bags, reusable cups, those kind of things. And really recognizing that, um, you know, the single use item reduction is also a critical health strategy for the health of not just the planet, but for uh, people as well. 
And so uh, hoping that uh, some of you might be able to join us at uh, and details around the National Zero Waste site. Thank you, Councillor Fry. Uh, Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, I was just looking for an update um, around the um, or the prospects of the navigation center. Uh, I know that there was uh, we were looking for siting, and if we have any further update on that. Thanks. So yes, there we are. Um, there has been a site identified. Um, there's a nonprofit partner that's currently involved looking at purchasing that site, um, and with support from BC Housing. So the there has been progress made on that, not able at this point to confirm that purchase or the location, um, but um, we're hopeful that that, um, that, <clears throat> pro that that location will come together and we'll be able to move forward with that particular uh, program. Okay, great. Uh, Thank you. With more, uh, more specifics. Yeah, I appreciate it. I understand that. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. I don't see anybody else on the queue for this, uh, so I guess we're to adjournment. Councillor Hardwick? Oh. Motion to adjourn. Okay. And we have a seconder for that. Second. Second. Thank you, Councillor Carr. All in favor of adjourning, say yay. 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 Say nay. Great. We're adjourned, clerks. We've done everything we need. Yes, perfect, Mayor. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the, the heat. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Bye, everyone. Okay. Bye bye. Bye, all.